entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here? You guys ready to save yourself? That's ready to pull yourself out of the pit of loneliness and misery and despair. Yes, I'm sure you are. That pill is here to save you from yourselves. So is game. Today I have uh, Myron Gaines, uh, who from Unplugged Fitness, uh, and we are going to be talking about the intersection, I guess, between red pill awareness and game and practice. Coming up. See, when you come on my show, Myron, you get cheers and jeers. <laughs> Today I've got Myron on with me. Wait, oh, see, there's your applause. See, Thank you very much. I'm gonna yeah. have to take a quick bow, even though I haven't done anything yet. <laughs> there we go. Okay, that's funny. I had, I, I think I almost got a Sterling Cooper to blush when I did that last time. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm having. In case anybody didn't know, I'm, I'm kind of trying to get uh, some of the sort of extended Rule Zero family on my show, so I can introduce people and sort of pe get people familiar with what we're going to be doing on October 2nd and 3rd, which will be the uh, digital online conference. Uh, we will be doing a, a uh, all online conference from uh, our <laughs> the comfort of our own homes. Uh, we had to, um, well, well, we'll get into that later. I, I um, the, the show on uh, Saturday's uh, Rule Zero, we're going to have everybody on. We're going to be talking and taking questions about the, the conference. And also, uh, we will be opening up uh, registration for one week only from the 12th until the 16th, I believe. Yeah. And um, so we'll be talking about that a little bit more later. But uh, Myron, you are one of the uh, extended family, I think, for for Rule Zero. Um, of course, it's uh, the five of us, myself and Rich Cooper and Ryan Stone and uh, John from Modern Life Dating, who introduced us. And of course, Troy Francis. And then we've also got you. Um, we've got Aaron Clary. We've got uh, Paul Benjamin. Um uh, we have uh, John Fitch, uh, MMA fighter John Fitch, and uh, adult film superstar Sterling Cooper, who I had on the show last week. So, uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself, what it is that you do. I, I was sort of uh, impressed by you because of your game knowledge. I would fit you into the category of where John is and Troy is. Um, and I think one of the strengths of Rule Zero is that we have such a diverse um, – panoply let's just say of of guys who can speak on a variety of, of subjects that are really i think are what guys are really into right now it's not about politics it's not about religion it's not about um you know it's not about old school kind of you know man up uh, conventional whatever <laughs> it's uh it's it's factual it's actionable information it's down to earth and i think you're definitely part of that so what to, uh, let let everybody know what exactly you do who for the people who don't know uh, what's up, guys? Myron Gaines, for you guys that aren't uh, familiar with me. Um, I'm First of all, Ro, thank you for having me on the show. Um, give you guys a quick little background on me. Um, I grew up in Connecticut, uh, New Britain, Connecticut, to be exact. My parents are from Sudan. They immigrated here in the 80s. Uh, my parents are still here, uh, still together to this day. So I grew up in a two-parent household. Uh, I currently live in Miami, Florida. I'm a fitness coach. Um, but I'm also, I guess I, I didn't like advertise it too much, but I, I'm pretty good with the ladies, uh, being here in Miami forces you to be so because you pretty much fall in one cat, one of three categories. You're either good with the ladies and you get what you want. B tricking, spending money on these chicks and they don't respect you mm -hmm. or C you're just not getting laid at all. So, uh, well, <laughs> thankfully I'm in, in, the, in the first one, but the thing is, is that, um, being here in Miami has taught me the hard way. Uh, that you need to have uh, red pill awareness to like be good with the ladies here, uh, especially in cities like Miami, New York City, LA, etc. Um, you got to know, you got to understand female nature so that you don't number one, so you don't get mad, and then number two, so you know how to move correctly without getting fleeced. Um, and I'm 30 years old, guys, so I'm pretty much 
right in the middle where I'm young enough to understand the importance of social media game and having an online presence to attract women in today's contemporary dating world. But I'm also old enough to have the experience to speak on, you know, uh, some traditional things as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's kind of my background. I grew up in a Muslim household, so that's a little mm -hmm. more. So there's, a, there's that. So are you are you practicing Muslim or are you just that's just your household? It's it's my household. I'm not gonna lie. I'm a crappy Muslim. I need to pray more. <laughs> uh, I hear you. I feel it. Like, well, I mean, I I, I talked to uh, like Abu American. Uh, I'm I'm fairly good friends with as well. Um, he's been sort of a, a a real help with my fourth book, which is uh, sort of on the intersection of religion and, and red pill. Um, Abu's good people. Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, and so. And so, and, and you, uh, as far as your, your real job, do you want to talk about what your real job is or uh, I'm a school teacher? Okay, good <laughs> <enough>. <laughs> I, well, that, That's one of the things that sort of like, um, that one of the things that I was sort of attracted to by was the fact that you actually have another job outside of what it is that you're doing as well. Um, a lot of guys in this space, this is all they do. And yeah. So I think that that really frees up. Like I, one of the things that I think really was a strength of my own work and and some other guys that I know of is that they came into this sphere uh, as sort of as a passion or something that they really wanted to get in, involved with, just because it was something that was going on and they had already made uh, a good chunk of change or they were already at least semi successful in what it was they were doing before they started a YouTube channel or before they started doing, you know, writing or doing whatever it is in, in uh, the manosphere or red pill awareness. Rich is one of the, uh, Rich Cooper is one of those guys. I mean, he'd, he'd already sort of been a self-made guy before he came into all of this. Yeah. Uh, I, and I just, you don't have to tell everybody what you do, but just, let's just say for sake of argument, uh, Myron already has, he has a day job. Okay. So it's not, this isn't just like his own thing. And I, I think one of the things that about that is it frees you up to be a little bit more, um, uh, bold, I guess, or if you um, if your revenue or if your, your, your way of life, your well-being isn't dependent on, you know, selling courses or, or being a pickup artist or doing YouTube videos or that kind of stuff. Uh, I think it, what it does is it sort of allows you to talk about what you want to talk about rather than what people want you to talk about. Yeah, it allows me to be really um, candid and frank with men. You yeah. know, uh, shout out to John from Model Life Dating. You know, he's the one that put us in, put me in touch with Rolla. Yeah. You know, we've been linking up ever since. And uh, you know, behind the scenes, I help John a lot with his courses when he's you know coaching hundreds of guys with with mm -hmm. online dating, fitness, whatever it may be. And I think one of the biggest things that I really uh, have to do a lot of the times when I'm talking to the guys behind the scenes is. I have to kind of give them, I always tell them, I'm going to pretend I'm a hot 21 year old bimbo and I'm going to critique you right now. And I'll mm -hmm. tell them exactly what like an attractive woman would be thinking if they were to see their online dating profile, their tonality, the way they speak, et cetera. And it really helps guys because you kind of have to give them with men, just like you always talk about rolling, you got to give them like overt communication of like where they're messing up. Otherwise they're not really going to be able to like take those steps and move forward because uh, a lot of men need to learn through some kind of like negative reinforcement. Like when I was a kid right. growing up, I did something stupid. My dad would smack me, and then I realized, oh, okay, I shouldn't be doing that. So, like, mm -hmm. I feel like guys got to like put their hand on the stove and get burned to truly learn. You know? Do you have any brothers or sisters? Yeah, I have a sister. She's in med school right now, and uh, I have a little brother. He's eighteen. So you're the middle kid. I'm the oldest, actually. You're the oldest. Okay. Yeah, oldest. All right. All right then. Cool. That's good. Well, I think that's interesting because I think that uh, guys who have a um, well, sort of an intact family. Uh, let alone have like siblings uh, have a different experience, I think, sort of in their maturation process uh, than, you know, guys who are the product of a single mother or, or a single you know parent or whatever it is. Um, and I think that and, and maybe coming from a, a Muslim household, uh, things are a little bit you know, different for you as far as your upbringing was concerned, or your socialization, your acculturation. Yeah, um, like it's like natural, like. I, I always say this story like my um my mom used to cook and clean for my dad mm -hmm. and like i remember if she didn't pack him lunch and he went to work like mm -hmm. she would have anxiety you know what i mean like she would literally be like he left without his food and she'd start mm -hmm. panicking like she'd want to like drive it to him or whatever and uh there was just this deep sense of respect that my mom has for my mm -hmm. father and uh, i think that's a big re and i didn't and the thing is growing up as a kid i didn't know better i was like oh okay everyone just has two parents it's whatever and mm -hmm. it's not until i become an adult right in the past year or two especially like consuming this type of content like talk, speaking with you speaking with other content creators about the about the problems right now that i realize that this is 
that it's not normal to have two parents and it's actually the norm to become from a single parent household namely a single mom household and uh you know that stability isn't there so um but I, that's one thing i'm looking back now as a kid uh, well looking back as an adult now from my mm -hmm. childhood i'm like it was like a very stable household because even though we weren't rich at all um the fact that two parents were home uh made things stable yeah yeah exactly and i i in my third book in uh in positive masculinity i make that case too is uh i had guys who would come up to me i think it was like the man in demand conference back in 2015 and they would ask me like they, they'd be single parents or whatever or they would be guys who want to have kids but they're like they're just like complete i don't want to say they were black pill at the time because there weren't really black pill there wasn't really any like sort of black pill or doom pill there was some MGTOWs that was just sort of coming around about that time where they were the 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 you know the acronym people started using i think back then a little bit bit more more you know fluidly i think but i had guys ask me like how do i have kids without a wife or a woman and i'm like why would you want to do that mm -hmm. because we criticize single mothers all the time for you know raising you know children as you know criminals or drug addicts or you know we can look at the statistics um it, in like books like the boy crisis by dr warren farrell um, you can look at stuff like that and and see that that you know, having one parent is is something that's hobbles. I think the the development of well, a, you know, a boy or a girl, really. Um, and so, like I was telling them, I said, you know, like if if you want to do that, I mean, single fathers actually raise better kids than single mothers. Unfortunately, oh, yeah. that's that's the stats right there. But if it's a single father or an intact family, the intact family is going to raise their kid because you have the model for conventional femininity and conventional masculinity, hopefully, ideally, let's just say, um, you know, assuming that the father's not, you know, uh, sort of a, I don't know, blue pair and the, and the, yeah, well, and then the, uh, the wife isn't some sort of domineering, you know, Oh uh, yeah. As long as, the, as long as the roles aren't switched out, I suppose. And that's the other thing too. Like, um, my father was the, the head of the head of the household. He was the leader. Like my mom never really, you know what I mean? Like she just followed what, what he did. You know, I remember when we moved from New York city to Connecticut and as a kid, she right. just followed him, you know, she didn't really argue. It is what it is. And like in, um, Islamic culture, obviously we all know that, you know, it's male led and, you know, women are supposed to help their wife or their husbands or whatever it may be. But, uh, that, that it just doesn't work. The, the thing is this, I, I agree with you that like, the father is the reinforcement. So like I always say strong dads keep daughters off stripper poles and sons out of jail. And the reason why I think uh, single fathers perform better than single mothers is that single mothers, they're going to nurture you and care for you, whatever. But what you really need when you're growing up as a teenager through, through those, through those formative years is like you need discipline because if your dad doesn't discipline you and teach you the way of the world, like the negative consequences that come from making mistakes, the system, mm -hmm going to teach you and if the system teaches you it's too late because then by then you're getting arrested you're possibly getting a conviction a felony conviction whatever it may be you're doing drugs you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing that's going to literally destroy your ability to grow up into a productive member of society so i think if anything even if a father gives you tough love and you don't get mm -hmm. that nurturing that discipline is more important you know if i had to pick one so i, does I, it, I, does I think they know, they know, they know what you do does your dad know like that you do like game theory and uh you know, uh, you know i don't know if they want you, you know, pick up really but yeah does he know that you do that i, I don't know if he knows man I, that's a good question like i don't really like share my youtube stuff with them or anything <laughs> like that I, I i always ask guys like to because uh, a lot of guys will say does your wife know that you do this does your wife read your books does your daughter know that you yeah yeah they all do okay so let's just get that out of the way <laughs> they all know what i'm doing so uh, I, I think it's funny because like people ask me that and then they'll try to shame me. They'll go, what would your daughter have? To, what would your wife say if she knew you were doing this? Like, my wife's known this for like at least 12, 15 years, man. Yeah, you guys have been together for like 20, right? 24, actually. 24 in July and we've been together 25. So we, we dated and, and hung out together for a, a year before we got married. So, yeah. Yeah, it's been, I, I, and I, that's funny you should say that because I, I think a lot of people say, and and I got this from you know writing uh, book four is a lot of people say that well you know uh, was it Islam is the way forward and I was like well yeah I mean because it's the last sort of patriarchal holdout I think um, as far as religious religions are concerned although their you know feminism and gynocentrism is making inroads into Islam right now it's just sure, yeah. a lot longer than it did for like say Christianity because Christianity was like the predominant religion on planet Earth and that was where everything started. Started. So, um, we're about 30 years behind. I don't think it is. Yeah. I don't think it is so much a, a Islam thing as it is a masculine authority thing. And I think in is in those, in that, those cultures, in that religion, 
uh, male authority is something that is expected of that guy. There's a there's is a commensurate uh, authority that is uh, that goes along with the responsibility because your dad still has the responsibility to you and your your sister and your brother, right? And to raise you, you know, as yeah, hopefully well adjusted human beings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I me mean, growing up as a teenager, man, like I didn't like my dad because he used to like. Like I, I try to, uh, I used to play video games back in the day, Halo Two, like uh, semi professionally, and he'd mm -hmm. get pissed that I would play so many hours of video games, and he'd like get mad and he'd break my my Xbox or my TV and say, "Hey, stop being a loser!" But like, yeah. looking back, I'm glad he did that, you know. Yeah. My dad wasn't a, wasn't so much a hard ass. I think he was just more of like sort of a practical guy. He was much more pragmatic. And and my dad, I mean, this is a different different time, of course. I can remember my dad just like telling me to get get up early and like i'm like and do what and he's like i don't know something productive just get out and go do it you know it didn't matter what it was it was just like get off your ass and go do something mm -hmm. yeah. um so so how many got well let me ask you this what got you into doing like what you do now which i think is effectively game but you also do like fitness stuff as well yeah so um i, I, I so the, the people that really kind of like pushed me were uh, John and, and Donovan Sharp and, you know, off behind the scenes. And I was helping John with his uh, with his students at the body language mastery or his clients. Uh, you know, I would I would chime in about how to deal with with women on dates. And I started sharing my information They're like, hey, man, you know a lot about this. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, you got to kind of learn being here in Miami. Otherwise, you're going to take an L. And, um, and they kind of like motivated me. They said, Hey man, you need to like make a YouTube channel, start putting out some content. Cause people are going to, are going to enjoy this, you know, cause you it, basically I'm, I'm in one of the most competitive marketplaces, right? Sexual marketplaces. Sure. And then I'm also in, in a, like in the perfect age demographic to be able to deal with, like, I know what the teen, young guys are dealing with, but I also know what the older guys are dealing with as well. And then mm -hmm. on top of that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's just, it, it just, um, my life experiences from other things, you know? So I was, a, I was able to apply uh, my life experiences and be able to push that on like my teachings on how to deal with women, with guys. So they mm -hmm. were like really instrumental in getting me motivated to, uh, start d doing this and showing this side. Cause I used to keep it on the wraps that I knew all this stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. but I'm like, you know what, man, I'll just, it is what it is. I'll, sh I'll share some of my stuff. So for me, I just like helping guys out, giving them practical advice on how to, to deal with women. Cause when you break it down, um, most guys' problems with women come down to probably two things. It comes down from not working enough volume, and that right, and that typically stems from not doing enough approaches. That mm -hmm. I would say is like the root problem for most guys where they're not working enough volume. And when I tell guys the real numbers of what it takes to be successful with women, mm -hmm. it's a little <laughs> it intimidates them a bit, but then they kind of realize that okay, like you really do got to talk to. 50 girls a night plus if you're trying to pull that night you know what i mean like mm -hmm. it, it, these these are the raw numbers behind the success that people don't really talk about because like when you look at other channels they're just showing you like them pulling a chick but they're not showing you all the l's that it took to get there and for me i i like talking about my l's because i feel like people learn a lot more from that um yeah. and yeah you know it's funny is i i i compare this <laughs> you're gonna laugh at this i uh i compare like you know, going out and, and making approaches and stuff like I compare that to like watching um, like fishing channels, like watching bass fishing or watching like, you know, deep sea fishing. It's like they only show you the highlights. They don't yeah. show you they're like sitting there getting skunked for like four hours or the ones that snap off and they're and they're gone kind of thing. They only see the highlight reels where like they're pulling in this like big trophy marlin or, or big, huge, you know, 12 pound bass or something like that. It's the same thing. And it I. I was going to ask you this is uh, so your as far as your background is concerned, like where did you learn? Did you like did you ever watch like were you into RSD for a while? Did you ever like study mystery stuff or like what got you into because you're talking about like approaches and stuff like that. So I, I presume, you know, at least some kind of like old school classic kind of game techniques. Yeah. So and, and and before I answer that, like, yeah, like when I tell guys like I go one for 40 easily, one for 20 to 40 when I do night game, people are like what? And I'm like, yeah, dude, like it takes that many mm -hmm. approaches to really figure it out. But I'll say so how I kind of came across this stuff, um, just like a lot of guys um, I, growing up, I was a, ner a nerd, you know, skinny nerd, 164 pounds, six foot two, six foot three. And uh, in high school, I had trouble with women, like bad. You know what I mean? Like oh, I you're six foot two, and you had trouble with women. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. You know, I'm six like foot two. Not just about height, right? Yeah. Exactly. So I had a lot of trouble with the ladies. So, um, so I, I'll never forget. VH1 had the show, the pickup artist, and that kind of exposed, just like with a lot of viewers here, I'm sure. 
right. in the same shoes. Uh, it exposed me to this this world of guys that are like, you know, uh, pickup artists, guys that teach men how to be attractive with women. And I'll never forget, I got the mystery method and I read it. Um, and then I also read another book called Conquer Your Campus by a guy named Mark Redman, which is like a crappy mm -hmm. book. You can Google it and find it now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the mystery method kind of gave me the theory of how women may select and it like blew my mind. And then right before I went to college, I read a book called Conquer Your Campus by Mark Redman. And that book uh, really broke down the importance of social status within the confinements of a college campus. Mm -hmm. and, and what I did was I was like, wow, okay, this is like, because basically I always, because when I it, uh, talk to guys that are in college, like trying to game in college, I basically tell them college is like a mini world. It's like, it's yeah. like the world, it's the global sexual marketplace, but within one campus. So like, for example, if you're an athlete on campus, that is the same as like, let's say a professional athlete in the real world, or if you're a frat guy. It's a localized, it's a localized sexual marketplace. Exactly. Influenced by the global sexual marketplace, yeah. Exactly, so so I read that book and then it, things really started to click when I went to college. I wrote in college division one and uh, things clicked when I started to like get women uh, being an athlete in college. And that was like, oh wow, status really does mean everything. You know what I mean? It, well, not everything, but it's very important, you know, because obviously as a, on a sports team, you just get a certain perceived status without even trying. And then, you know, I was able to pull girls like that. And then when I transitioned into the real world, uh, there was a period of time where like I was having tough, uh, I was fine, having trouble meeting women. Mm -hmm. And uh, because obviously I had just got out of college, then, like I was domain dependent, as we say, right? right. Uh, and then I was able to figure it out again uh, once I got here to Miami about two years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, basically like, you know, cause that, that when I got here, I was like taking L's left and right. I was going doing that game. Like I was just putting everything to the wall and seeing what sticks. So I basically drank through a fire hose when I got here and it's good. I'm going on three years now, but like, I learned a lot being down here. Yeah. And that's a tough, uh, you know, if you're going to talk about like local, localized sexual marketplaces, Miami is one of the toughest right there because I, when I was living in Orlando and I, I lived in Orlando from 2005 to about 2013 and that was my I was heavily involved in my liquor industry job at that time. And we would do promos down in Deerfield Beach, down in South Beach, down in uh, in Miami. Uh, and then I noticed a quantifiable or qualifiable difference from like the the gigs that we had to do down there to the ones we were doing like up in like St. Augustine or we we're doing it like in Daytona or something like that. And and yeah, I could I can I can relate. I I I feel you because that it, it is um that is like high level game. And like, I think you were talking about um, how when there is like a really super hot girl, like the nines and the tens and stuff mm -hmm. like that, that they, I mean, that, that level, like to be a nine or a 10 in that kind of localized sexual marketplace is to be like an 11 or a 12 in some other, you know, like, you know, some other state or some other, you know, thing. I, I think a lot of times when we, when we look at, um, what that particular domain is all about it's it's regional and miami is i think is one of the tightest ones uh there's some places in los angeles that are a little bit different uh, i yeah. think Vegas is one of those um other places like I, I guess you could say i guess you could say new york um but i think miami is probably if if not the most elite place to run game yeah it's it, it's it's good and bad it's good because it's a target rich environment because like mm -hmm. I, I what i've noticed being here south florida in general between uh miami and fort lauderdale you know highest concentration of attractive women that I've seen, you know, but the negative is that it's very competitive here. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I told a story one time about how I lost a girl to little Wayne, which I can tell that story if your audience mm -hmm. is interested, mm -hmm. but, uh, you, you want me to, okay, I'll tell it real quick. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. I mean, that'd be a good illustration of like, yeah. so I'll tell you guys how Miami is. Right. So I was at a club. I think it was either live or story, which are one of the, the, the two, there, there's two top clubs here in Miami guys. Uh, and I talked about this on my podcast, how to run game in Miami with my boy, Fresh Prince CEO, shout out to him. He's in the chat, uh, CEO lifestyle. But like we talked about how to get girls in Miami. And one of the things we tell guys is, you know, if you're going to go to Miami Beach, right, it's OK. Just don't spend all your time there. So I was at this club, uh, Living Story, which I normally don't go to. But I, it was like a special occasion. I was there with a friend or whatever. I meet this really attractive blonde, like five foot ten, blonde hair, blue eyes, my, exactly what I go for. Right. So uh, I talked to her, you know, we're, we're chatting. I get a number close and I get her Instagram. So like I get both typically. Right. And um, I was like, all right, let's let's uh, go on a date uh, tomorrow. Right. Because like, as you guys know, I'm uh, seeing me work with John. I always say close the lead quickly. You know what I mean? Time kills all deals. So if you get a, a number or a lead, you need to work on it right away and try to set up the date immediately while the buying temperature is hot. So I try to set up a date with her the next day. 
and she starts being less responsive on text messages, what you know, starts to get flaky. And I'm like, oh, here we go. You know what I mean? Because at this point, I had been in Miami for like a year and a half or so. So I kind of understood that she probably met some other guy that was going to take her on a boat or whatever. Because like there's always dudes here, like girls here select guys based on like the highest bidder. Who can show me the most fun? So it's common that you'll lose a girl to like some old dude that's going to put her on a boat and not bang anyway. But <laughs> but I looked at her Instagram and I see that she's uh, putting screenshots of herself DMing with Lil Wayne. And mm-hmm. and he basically <laughs> was telling, yeah, because <laughs> she put it in her story and and wow. and uh, and I like double checked it was his real Instagram, little Tunichi, Tunichi, whatever it is, mm-hmm. and uh, in it she basically like what the message thread showed was he she was he was like hey let's chill later she was like okay and he was like all right cool and like he sent her <laughs> his number and mm-hmm. I was like oh okay that's why she didn't hang out with me and the thing uh, what that story really taught me was that you guys can't internalize rejection because. A lot of the times you'll get rejected, not necessarily because it's your fault, but because something better came along. And right. when you live in cities like Miami, New York, uh, New York City, L.A., et cetera, these super what I call hypergamy hotspots, <laughs> you know, yeah. where the women can afford to be as hypergamous as they want to be because they're attractive and they can do it. You're going to be competing with uh, professional athletes, with rappers, whatever. You know, I used to date a chick that used to, you know, go out and see Future weekly, you know, so. <laughs> It's it's not uncommon when you're dealing with like very attractive women in major cities that they're dealing with like athletes and stuff like that. So with that said, I, I, I think a lot of guys internalize rejection. And they get mad at women for it. But mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the time, it's not even your guys' fault. It's that something else probably came better. And mm-hmm. that's just what it is, you know? Yeah, something that a mitigating factor. I, that was, of course, well, technically, it was one of the... Uh one of the influences for I'm Real Tomasi number three, which of course is any woman that makes you wait for sex, the sex is never worth the wait. Generally, like people want to say, well, that's just Rolo saying, just go bang anything on two legs. It's like, no, no, that's not. It's really about genuine desire. And it's really about pragmatism in a sense. I know you did a, I know you did an interview with uh, Alan Roger Curry not too long ago about mode one or like direct game, just get in, get out, you know, just add, you know, be direct and blunt as possible. And I want to um, add something too to what you said about mm-hmm. like, cause I, I think pe- when people hear you say um, you, you should never let the, you should never wait for sex because the sex is never worth it. Like that is 1000% true. And what I tell my guys is, if you were future or Drake, would this girl sleep with you right now? The, pro- the answer is probably yes. If the answer is yes, then you need to figure out why you need to make it a yes. If it's a no, then you got to figure out why it's a no. And, and nine out of 10 times is because she doesn't see you as her best option. Because like, just like you say, well, a woman can't afford to take a bet uh, like with a high value guy. So she's going to give it up. She's not going to sit there and be like, oh, whatever. Because anytime a girl withhold sex from you what she's basically doing is she's leveraging her sexuality against you and in return for some kind of compliance resources uh time attention whatever it may be like anytime a girl withholds sex from you so you got to be so high value that she can't mm-hmm. afford to miss the opportunity to do it and and this is very interesting because i think me and donovan talked about this mm-hmm. there's a woman her name is selena powell right mm-hmm. she's an instagram girl uh she, she has basically made a name for herself by having sex with rappers and uh uh, athletes, whatever it may be, blue check mark guys, people with clout, as we would say, right? Mm-hmm. And she made a video on YouTube teaching women how to slide in the DMs of a rapper. And I like to look at this content because I like to see it from the other side. Obviously, it makes me more informed about uh, the others, you know, the, the the male side of the sexual marketplace. But to see the female side is interesting too. And what she advised the women was, if a rapper tells you to come to his place and he invites you to his hotel, you better be about it. Because if you're not, they're going to kick you out of the, the the hotel immediately. And I thought that was fascinating because it literally confirms what you've been talking about, that mm-hmm. high value guys don't sit there, sit, sit there and tolerate sex with, with women withholding sex from them because they're like, get out. I'm going to go talk to someone else. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And That's right. That that is actually – see, this is why I wanted to talk to you. <laughs> right, what, we're, what we're discussing right now is sort of the – I would say the intersection or the dovetailing, let's just say, or the, the symbiosis, let's say, between red pill theory and game as the practice. Exactly. Because when I go and I say, look, when a, when a woman – puts you on hold or when she says, no, I'm going to make you wait. Uh, it kind of comes back to, uh, this is a, a, a manosphere maxim. I, I think people are like attributing this to me and, and oh, okay. I mean, maybe, but uh, women make rules for betas and they break rules for alphas. Thanks. So if like you're saying, if it's Drake or it's little Wayne, what, you know, whoever is somebody who is a high value who has like confirmed, you know, fame, that's easy. It's easy to make those, those, uh, estimation so like if you're gonna if you're gonna get blown out by you know little wayne okay what are you gonna do like you're gonna okay well it's i mean it's little wayne you know or it's whoever a rock star an actor or whatever yeah okay i get it 
But for the most part, most guys don't realize that they're sort of uh, a little bit lower on the on the ladder waiting for you know, the woman waiting for to see if something's going to work out with that guy. So or it's or when a woman is making rules for you, it's usually to sort of keep you on ice or to keep you on hold until such time as she can see, determine what what's going to happen in this other situation. In the meantime, you're wasting your time there kind of hoping and praying that things are going to work out. And oh, boy, I think she's the one and blah, blah, blah. At the same time, by you waiting, that confirms that you're not a high value guy. Because right. high value guys don't wait. So, yeah. or high value guys, when women make rules for those guys, the high value guys understand that sort of instinctually that women make rules for beta guys and they break rules for alpha guys. And so, when you're talking about this, uh, so what's the practical application of that? Uh, you can talk about mode one. It's like, well, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to be more pragmatic about it. I'm not going to sit around here and wait for a let's just be friends, you know, rejection. I am going to spin plates. And that's really what plate theory is about as well is, is maximizing efficiency. And so, but what's the practice? The practice of that is you got to have a roster, man. And you got to, and you have to, I hate to say spam approaches because I don't want to call it really spamming approaches, but I think you need to sort of have a persistence in defaulting, like always default to game. That's old Royce maxim is always default to game. There is no, there is no time that it, there is no place or time, whatever that isn't a good time to default to game, if you're in that situation. Like, like you're in the bookstore, you're at college, you're at a club, you're where on the beach, wherever you're at. Um, it's always default to game. Even if you don't really want to get with that girl, you're still practicing. You're still getting into that habit because most guys aren't in the habit. And let's talk about play theory real quick and and the, and the application in that. So, uh, like I said earlier, a lot of guys' problems with women, 99% of the time, not 90, but most of the time stem from their inability to work volume and their inability to work volume typically is because they don't want to approach. So with play theory, the thing is this, I always say women get in line when they know you have other w women in line. You know what I mean? This is why rappers can sit there and if a chick shows up at his hotel and she's like, oh, I don't want to do it. He's like, all right, get out. And then he's going to DM like another IG model. The reason why they can do that is because they have options. And I always say when you work volume and you're dealing with multiple leads, your investment in each lead is going to be less. And when you're in, not investing that much in each lead, it actually makes you more attractive because you're basically playing the game how women play. It's just that women don't advertise that they spend plates because, you know, they're, they're, it's it's ne it's ne there's negative social ramifications to that. You know what I mean? They're going to be looked at as as uh, promiscuous, whatever it may be, because I always say women sell purity, men sell success. So mm -hmm. even if a girl really gets down, she's going to lie to you and tell you, oh, I'm not talking to anybody else, whatever, because her ability to lock down a high value guy hinges upon her being able to sell her purity. Right. So she's right. basically like a used car salesman. So <laughs> with uh, with with men, however, like for us to be able to compete in the marketplace with them, we need to kind of adopt their same strategy. However, with men, we have to earn our abundance mindset. Women just have it naturally. You know what right. I mean? Exactly. It's burden of performance, right? So yeah. it's, you have to, men must become women just are. Exactly. And, uh, I, I get this all the time because guys will say, guys, uh, particularly on sort of like the MGTOW side of things will say, well, and, and I don't want to just pick on them. Like the doom pill guys will, mm -hmm. will send me articles about like some woman who's like 45 years old and she's banging some guy who's like in your, in his twenties. So Asia Argento was actually a good illustration of that, but they'll say, Oh, it doesn't matter. A woman calls, she has to do is spread her legs and she's, she can get whatever she wants. I'm like, yeah, but is she getting what she really wants or is it just about the sex side of things? Yeah. And I think that when guys see, uh, particularly with, uh, with only fans or they see, um, uh, like Bella Thorne, like taking advantage of all these guys on on OnlyFans, or they'll. Uh, I, I just saw an article on, and I want to. It was in like Forbes or something like that. It was this girl who is just kind of an average. She's not like really like super pretty or anything. Like she's good looking. I mean, she kind of looked like Liv Tyler, and she's making a hundred thousand dollars a month off of her solo. She doesn't have any. She has no handlers. She just does it herself. Mm. She that's sure. that how she makes a living and she makes a hundred thousand dollars a month off of this she's like one of the like 0.04 percent of the top earners of only fans and i think that when when guys see that uh they they think that women are like super powerful like they've got some sort of magical power over these guys and when a woman is between say 22 and 24 years old and that sort of age range right there yeah because they're at the peak uh if they have played their cards right and they stayed in shape and they understand the game well enough and they they know what they're doing yeah they're at their peak they're at the summit of their sexual market prowess and they're at the summit of their agency it goes down from 25 on down 
But until that, and, and women can do things to sort of, you know, you know, slow that descent. Mm-hmm. But yeah, when, so when you go to like one of these clubs in, in Miami or Vegas or wherever you're at and you see a girl there who's like 22, 23 years old and she is just, you would say that's a nine or nine and a half, whatever. Yeah. She's, she is, uh, she's controlling the market, right? She's the yeah. one that's there that says, yeah. And she, so you are playing most guy, unless you are at an elite level, unless you're like have fame and you have some kind of like really confirmable social proof or pre-selection uh you're going to be playing up to that because she's she's going to have a roster like i've I've said before uh, this was in plate theory i think number five was women are natural plate spinners that's that is their strategy because it's it's prudent it's it's good like why wouldn't you want to select from the best you know of the best so i think um, finish wrap their head around that go ahead no, no, no. Just to finish the play theory thing, like, because, you know, we, you talk about play theory and like I was, I was saying, like with the application, the reason why it's so important for you as a guy to spin plates is because mm-hmm. you invest less in each interaction that you deal with women, you become more attractive. And then therefore it will keep you from being thirsty or over investing in women. Because one thing I've noticed, especially with like young, attractive women, if you over invest too much in the beginning, she's not going to respect you or take you seriously. So working a lot of volume allows you to naturally not invest a lot in the interaction so that you come off as more attractive because most guys that talk to really attractive girls you know are very uh desperate they push a little too hard and she gets repulsed by that and the other thing you mentioned about the nightclub where the girl has all the power so let's talk about application and again Mm because as you guys know i do a lot of night game here in miami which is very competitive i call it the olympics of night game and um one thing i do i have two ways that, that i do night well there's two two methods of when i do night game when i do night game i go either to number collect or I see which girl is, um, which girls are actually available. And what I do is when I go up and I meet women, similar to what me and uh, Alan Roger Curry were talking about, shout out to him. I approach a girl and I basically feel if she, I, I basically, I screen her out to see if she's actually available or not. Because a lot of girls in this current marketplace will go to clubs and bars and nightclubs, et cetera, to get attention, to take pictures for their Instagram, for their Snapchat, so that they can put out this certain lifestyle that they live. Oh, and, wow. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So they, so they love doing that. So what I'll do is I go, uh, I talk to, this is why I go through so many women like so quickly and during a night game session because a lot of girls have either bad logistics, they're there to, uh, you know, just get attention. They're there to get free drinks, whatever it may be. So I have to like get rid of all those time wasters and quickly find the girls that are actually, actually are available and interested in me. Now to, on the other side, I say the one way you can equalize in a nightclub as a guy, right? Even though I don't do this all the time, but if I do do it, I run it this way is running table game. And why I say that is because in the nightlife, the woman has way higher perceived status than you as the man. Even if you spend money at the club, you're still at the bottom of the totem pole. So one way to naturally increase your status within the club uh, is to get a table. Now, with that said, most guys run tables incorrectly. They, they, you know, they're over here supplicating to women, giving them free liquor, whatever it may be. And I always tell guys, instead of doing that, this is how you run table game. I'll give a quick little freebie. So, um, when you get when you get run table game, you need two somewhere between two to four guys running the table, and one guy stays back. He holds on to the bottle. He he does not let anyone touch it. And then you can have one to two of your most charismatic guys go out and source. And the key here is that you need to source and get women from different sets. So like you don't want to pull like a big batch red party of 10 girls. You want to pull a two set here, a three set there, whatever it may be. Get back, you know, depending on how big your VIP is, 10, 15 girls, whatever it may be. And the important thing is since women have so much leverage in the club, right? Like they have all the power because I always say nightclubs, their bloodline is hot girls. That's how they get the men in to spend the money. The hot girls come in for free and then that draws in the thirsty guys that are going to spend money on them, buying them drinks or whatever. So what you need to do is kind of like take, uh, <laughs> you kind of, you, you need to equalize. So what you, what I would do is I'd bring them back different sets. So now there's a naturally competition anxiety. They see all these other women here. Who are these chicks? You know, and you're getting the pre-selection. Now this is where it becomes fun. If a girl doesn't comply, right, if she's not, like, interested or she's boring or, like, oh, well, I don't do that. I have a boyfriend. Boom, get out. And you kick her out in front of everybody. And let it be seen. And the thing is, is that when you do that, that's going to let the other girls know that they're not immortal and that they don't they don't control anything in this situation. You know what I'm saying? And that that right there will make them comply because when they see you kick out other hot girls, they're gonna be like, whoa, these guys are nuts. So then they're going to be more open to comply and they're going to uh, respect being at the table more and you're going to be higher perceived status. This is why like guy, like rappers like Future and stuff like that, 
they get so many women because they don't let women like uh, they basically are kind of jerks to chicks. You know what I mean? They kick them out. There's like a bunch of stories about like future kick, kicking chicks out of his hotel or not paying them or whatever. And it's funny. But the, mm. the point is, is that when you um, kind of let women know, especially very attractive women, know that they're not above uh, getting kicked out or whatever. It makes you inherently more attractive because most guys don't have the balls to stand up to women. So that's how you do the table game. So you can actually have. Uh, a, a fair shot in night game, but I just like to do the cold approach. But if you're going to do tables, that's how you do it. That's how you work it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, again, it, it's kind of like perceived status as well. Is uh, I mean, that was the the early pickup artists picked up on this. Is that you know, it's uh, it's about getting a woman to qualify to you. And it's, of course, that's easier to do if you're like famous or you have like really definite definite like pre-selection and, and and social proof already so yeah. it's easy to do that that's the trick is most guys where, where most guys kind of give up is like well i'll never have that so i'm just gonna throw in the towel kind of thing and uh, again that comes with like like working numbers and and experiencing things uh experiencing you know it's okay to get rejected i think that's one of the one of the first things that like the early puas did i think in mystery method and rsd was they would get like a group of guys to go out to clubs and they would try to get rejected like mm -hmm. they would, it's like you would like it was a competition like you'd win a prize or something like that for the most like blowouts that you could get and really what that was was teaching guys to to not take it so serious like it wasn't an ego blow every time they they got rejected by a girl and so if you can make a game out of it and stuff, and what they eventually found out is that they got it got easier and easier to make approaches uh, let me let me get to this one guy real quick because this is a pretty good question here uh merciless says a uh, question for both of you uh if you had 60 seconds left to live and you could only teach a young man one of two things would it be self-confidence or true female nature which would you choose that is a really good question man i would say i teach him the self-confidence because if you get the self-confidence, that's just naturally going to make you more attractive. And then through trial and error, you're going to find you're going to find out female nature. It's going to take you longer, unfortunately, but mm -hmm. um, you'll at least put yourself in a position where you'll be attractive to even be able to deal with the women. And then when they inevitably mess up, because let's face it, like, <laughs> you know, when you when you deal when you're spinning plates, they, they a lot of them fall off and break. Um, but at least you'll be able to learn through um, through trial and error, kind of like how I did, how women really operate, especially the most attractive ones. I would um I would also agree with that. I would probably teach the truth about female nature because I think that's something that sort of leads guys down a wrong path or right down a more dangerous today anyways. It leads guys down a more dangerous path than anything else. The other thing is is that when we talk about confidence, I think confidence is something that guys think that they need to have. Like they that's what the first thing I you know, if you go and you look at a, a woman's profile on Tinder or, or or you know match or whatever, that's like one of those sort of nebulous things that has to be on there. I want a guy with confidence yeah. and or a guy has to be confident to get with me. And it's like so what happens is like you get like these guys who are like confidence brokers like like Tony Robbins or something. You gotta deep down dig down deep in that well of confidence and just bring yeah. it all motivational crap and that you want it that it's real it's real easy to figure out confidence confidence is derived from options and once you have those options or you know that you have the ability to generate those options that's where that confidence comes from and how does that how do you get those options you got to go and, and go get out there and practice and take it on the chin sometimes so that you can develop those options because sooner or later you will learn how to develop those options now i'm talking about women this could be anything right i mean it could be a job it could be you know just the things that you're passionate about whatever you are learning if you're going to be an apprentice of something you're going to have to bust yourself down and say you know what i'm going to fail at this before i get good at this it's like anything else Else. So it's not just, you know, confidence is not just about like, oh, well, got to be confident with girls. Well, you got to be confident in a lot of other things, too. And all those things are the confidence you get is derived from options <laughs> and yeah. from you being able to go back to those things. So like you're saying before, when you're spinning plates and this was actually a key element when I was writing the like six part series on spinning plates, you must you will as a man, you will act differently and you won't realize you are, but you will manifest behaviors and manifest attitudes and manifest things about yourself. Your personality will change because you know you have options. So if you've got three or four girls that are on your, your speed dial and you're working number five and she's not responsive or she's putting you on hold or she's saying, no, you got to follow these rules. You're like, you're more likely to say, fuck it, I'm out and, and go with one of the three or four girls that you already have sort of on speed dial and you're ready to ready to, to dial up because you know you have options. And you and even if you don't, maybe it, maybe she's the only one you're working. 
you also know that in the past you have been able to generate those options. Yep. So it's either gener- having the knowledge of having generated success and options in the past, or it is actually having actionable options in the present right there. That's how you start acting. You, you will manifest it in your behaviors. Women will pick up on that. You will be much more uh, n- natural. You will organically uh, experiment. You'll be much more bold. And that boldness is attractive to women. The idea that like there's something about this guy that makes him confident. What is it? It must be because there's other girls that want to get with this guy. He's already pre-selected. Guys want to be like him. Girls want to bang him. That's I'll say this boils down to. Go ahead. I want to get, so this is this is why this episode is going to be lit because we're going to give you guys the theory, and I'm going to give you guys my practical application as to why this is critical. So when you're when you're dealing with a lot of chicks, right, and so, so one of them does something stupid, you 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 will you. you when you're spinning plates and you're dealing with multiple women, you're not going to tolerate BS from women and they're going to feel that immediately. You know what I mean? And, and the thing is, is that most girls know that they can get over on most guys. They just know it. You know, they have guys saved in their phone as Uber or, or, or free dinner or whatever it may be. But like, if you're not one of those guys and it's very clear that she can't manipulate you, she's going to have to be more transparent. She's not going to be able to like bamboozle you as much. So she's instantly going to respect you for that. And then on top of that, if she does act out or whatever it may be, you just move on to another girl. And I'll say this, having girls also gets you other girls. It's basically passive DHVs. Like what, one thing I, uh, we did an episode on Donovan's show where we talked about how to deal with, uh, how to get this most attractive women, strippers, uh, bartenders, you know, only fans, girls, whatever, B- women that basically make money off of the way that they look. And one of the hired guns, so to speak. The way to get them is they need to see you with other women. Pre-selection is super important. So having girls helps you get other girls. This is why Dan Blazarian is so successful. He has zero game, and he doesn't even source his own women. He has a guy that he pays to go out and source them for him. Uh, And so do most Hollywood celebrities, which I can break that down too if you guys want, about like how these guys source their women. But in general, the fact that he has pictures with other attractive women co-signs him just like we always say in the sphere like you know women are typically more hive-minded creatures since they're the weaker sex they need to look at a bunch of other facts to be able to make their decision sexually so pre-selection i always say is like the strongest form of verifying that you're high value so yeah That's what, let me okay let me let me throw some theory in there yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so here's the thing about pre-selection when it comes to hypergamy women uh, like what were we just talking about a minute ago uh women between the ages of say 22 and 24 years old are at their peak sexual market value in this day and age okay like people say well not back in the renaissance period well okay we're not talking about that we're talking about this right here yeah and so right at that time i, th- I think really from the beginning of a woman or a, a young girl's life before she even hits puberty she realizes that her agency is going to be uh, invested in how much attention she can draw to herself. Like I've said this before, is that yep. attention is the coin of the realm and girl world. Right. And that attention then parlays into what's called agency. That's their power. That's how they can how they can manipulate guys. That's how they can get what they need. Because as you said, you say they're the weaker sex. This is what I say. They're the most vulnerable sex. There you go. They need things. And I think on a on an intrinsic evolutionary level, women understand that they are the most vulnerable sex. Like you, you're surrounded by the guys that you really want to get with. Well, all those guys tend to be like really six foot tall, you know, V taper, you know, <laughs> you know, six pack abs. Those are the, you know, chiseled chin. Those are the guys that, that you want to get with. Well, they look pretty powerful physically and they look like it probably crush you. So you've got to find some way to strategically get around that because you're the more vulnerable sex and you still want to get the best of the best. Well, that, that agency is perishable and only lasts for so long. So what, what happens is hypergamy cannot afford to make bad decisions because women's agency and their sexuality is sort of, it, it burns hot and bright and then it burns out. Whereas for men, our sexual market value years are really in our, thir- today are really in our 30s because it takes longer for men to mature, both physically and in uh, and emotionally and intelligent and irrationally, uh, life-wise, career-wise, uh, learning things. It takes longer for guys. It, like, what's the joke? The joke's like, you know, man doesn't become a man until he's 30 right now. Yeah. <laughs> It's when you're in your, your 20s, you're sort of just figuring things out, and then you're sort of building your empire by the time you get to the late 20s and into your 30s. And then, you know, by the time you're about 35 to 6, that's when you are going to be at your peak years of sexual selection. Well, women's peak years happens a lot earlier, and women or men's criteria for attraction and arousal is based on fertility and youth. And so, when is a woman at her peak years of power? Like we were just talking about powerful women. Powerful women are the women that that have that sexual agency that men will 
bend over backwards to get and pay small fortunes just to have them say hello to them now as we can see you want to see where the proof is go look at any only fans account because that's where the proof is right there so the the agency is right there but pre-selection is important because what it does is it outsources that approval of this guy is the hot guy this guy is the one and and even the early puas figured this out so yeah. if you can manufacture social proof and if you can manufacture um uh, pre-selection in some way like to be seen with hot girls that's what mystery used to do all the time like yeah. he, so he would say like he would say he, down to like positioning himself in the club so that he would be facing outward and have two girls on either side of him instead of him you know not facing outwards and and looking at girls and talking he says that's a that's a dead end right you have to be out and they have to be looking in at you that's pre-selection instead of you looking in at them you yep. know just that physical that physical positioning of the uh, of the body like body language in that that says uh, speaks volumes and hey, guys don't understand that even like little subtle things like that women are so sensitive to communication that 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 implies something to them that's a pre-selection here's a guy that's trying to He's too this. I girl trying to work this guy. So women rely. It's a. It's an evolutionary function. Is they have to rely on other women's opinions of other guys to be approved of it. Now, granted, that goes back to women's communitarianism and their col their collectivism and their like the building social networks of support because they're the most vulnerable sex. So they have to rely on the sisterhood and their friends, even if they don't know the girl. They don't even have to know the person, the, the the other girl who's giving social proof to that guy. They just go, okay, looks like that. Looks like Dan Blitzerian's the one. I'm gonna go over and get with this guy right here. It's an evolutionary function, and guys just simply like that's a that's a really hard one for guys to really figure out because they think it's just fickle, right? They just think it's just like, oh, it's just a girl being a girl. No, that's calculated. That's very very calculated, and it's so calculated. That it's been moved off to women's peripheral awareness. They don't even know that they're doing it. No, they're doing it, man. Yeah, it, it's like and here, here uh, I just when you brought the theory up with body language, I just want to touch on that with application a little bit. So one of the things I do when I'm out uh, doing whether it's day game or night game, uh, and I meet a woman uh, and I introduce myself, one of, like I had to train this bad habit out of me. But what I do is I literally stand up straight when I'm talking to her. I don't care how short she is, uh, how hot she is. I do not lean into her. I talk, mm -hmm. and if she can't hear me. What I'll do is I'll speak a little bit louder and I'll watch her body language. And what I'll typically, especially in night game venues, this is very important. If she leans into me or she turns towards me uh, and she reciprocates like my, uh, basically she reciprocates my positive actions where I'm starting to interaction with her, then I'll, you know, lean into her and reward that. But if I lean in in the beginning, it's a sign of low value because it shows, and Mystery talked about this all the time. It shows that you care too much about the interaction. Just like I said, you never want to invest first in girls. That's why when I say set up your dates or anything like that, the woman's got to come to you every single time because right. if she doesn't come to you, she's not investing. And if she's not investing, she's not going to value the, the relationship as much in the date. Oh, yeah. And she's not going to, and she's also not going to be in your frame. You know, that's why I tell guys, don't meet a girl halfway or any of that. She's got to come meet you and especially the other thing too to protect yourself because like the flake rate right now is astronomical mm -hmm. with um with women uh, flaking on men so the one way to protect yourself from that is you never ever meet a girl where she suggests or midway she's got to come to you so that's wow. where I, the, all these things that doing these things not leaning in making her come to you whatever these are higher value because bit, have, honestly having the balls to like not uh, let a woman lead or not to lean into her already infers that you're better than her, which she's, it, it sounds counterproductive, but she's going to uh, actually be attracted to because uh -huh. when you're trying to figure that out, her mouth might, might be saying something, but the hind brain is actually interpreting exactly. what your body language is and all this other stuff. I've been out with so many feminists, Rolo, that like, you know, they'll sit there and they'll subscribe <laughs> to feminist ideals. And uh, they, they, it's hilarious because like attraction truly isn't a choice because they'll be feminist or whatever. But when the check comes, they expect you to pay. Or, uh, you know, if someone were to break into the house, you would be expected to get up and deal with it. So like they're feminist when it's convenient, but they're also ladies when it's convenient. And the thing is, is that she can't fight biology like she's still going to be attracted to a guy that is physically superior to her, that leads, that's dominant, whatever it may be. Even the most left-wing feminists are like that. And I've dated a few here and, you know, they're all frauds, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it is, it is what it is. So it's just very interesting to see, um, the application was as far as like, uh, the application with like body language and how important that is because it signifies things about you and you don't even have to say a word because most guys don't have the balls to do a lot of these things. Yeah. Or they think that, 
well, I, I think maybe a lot of guys think that that most PUAs are sort of like overthinking things like, well, why she wouldn't do that? You know, like where they'll laugh at it like, ah, that's just a joke or like they don't see the underlying like sort of the latent purpose to different behaviors. I mean, that's where my background is in is in behavioral psychology. So when I see like certain behaviors, there's something that motivated that behavior. There's some incentive that prompted her to do that. As I was saying before, like when you have confidence, when you have options, it's going to change the way that you act when it comes to like women or when it comes to a job, for instance, like if you've got a, if you've got a really kick-ass job offer, you're going to be a whole lot more bold to go talk to your current boss and say, Hey, look, uh, I got a job from this, this job over here and let's play ball. Yeah. I, I'd like some more money. I want a pr promotion, blah, blah, blah. If that's not on the table. Then I'm going to go over here that like people like guys, like even the most, like the worst incel in the world can understand that. But he can't understand the same dynamic works for women as well. It works for it works for having having more than one. Uh, let me get to uh, Christian here. This is actually sort of on topic of what I was going to say. Is uh, he says, Myron, many guys this is Cr Christian Matico. Sorry, I keep saying your name wrong, Christian. Uh, Myron, many guys in the gym are gym cells. True. Many, I don't many <laughs> uh, who work out to get girls, but still lack confidence. Why do these guys lack confidence when they're putting the work in and how can they overcome that? I'll let you go with that. I got it. I have an answer for that as well, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, so it, honestly, guys, I, I know a bunch of gym cells and even myself, like I went in a period when I like got really fat and then I lost the weight. Like I almost made myself a gym cell. I was like, I'm not talking to no girls. I'm focused. And, and the, thing, the reason why a lot of guys um, are, are gym cells, it's, it's two reasons. Number one, uh, let's keep it real. Um, if you're serious about the gym, you're living a very bland lifestyle. You're not getting out there. You're not partying. You're maximizing your recovery. You're eating foods that aren't necessarily fun to eat. So your ability to go out and eat, enjoy fine dining, whatever it may be, which is what women love, mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to be there. And the other thing too, what I noticed, if you're a guy that's like in good shape and you eat healthy and you have a very strict lifestyle, women are going to be like kind of turned off by that. And what I mean by that is that girls just want to have fun. So them seeing you super disciplined and eating well and all this other stuff, it's a stark reminder that they're losers. <laughs> I, I hate to say that, but that's what it is. You know what I mean? So that's another thing. So girls don't want to feel that uh, that lack of comfort. And then lastly, a lot of guys that go to the gym that work out and everything like that, they're not socially calibrated, man. I can't tell you how many guys are tall, good looking, whatever it may be, but they're socially awkward around women. And and, and this is why I think cold approach is so important. We were talking about this yesterday on, on, on my podcast that when you approach a lot of a cold approach, a lot of women, you're going to start to naturally pick up social cues, body mm -hmm. language indicators, et cetera. That's going to make you more aware of what's actually going on. Cause I always say game is nothing more than the ability to have a conversation with opposite gender, assess the situation with real time facts coming to you and making decisions that will help you, uh, get the lay that you get the lay that you want. You're going to basically make calibrated moves that you know, are going to be higher, uh, have a higher probability of some kind of ROI for you sexually. So, um, doing cold approach, gets you practicing so that when you're out talking to girls, whatever it may be, you're starting to see universal body language signs that will either teach you to, you know, uh, push the interaction forward and, you know, start escalating Kino or sometimes even deescalate and build a little bit more comfort before you sexualize again. So mm -hmm. old approach teaches all you this stuff all naturally. Gym cells, a lot of these guys, they don't, they don't learn these things because they're in the gym all day. They're focusing on, you know, getting in great shape, whatever it may be. And when you're truly in the gym going hard, it's like a 24 seven commitment. So they don't even care about girls. A lot of these guys. Mm -hmm. So, um, the biggest mistake a guy can make, I think is relying on his looks too much and not understanding female nature and not understanding that you need to still be social and not be weird. Cause I've, I've, I've there's a bunch of guys that are good looking, but they're socially awkward. That will kill a girl's vibe even more. If you're good looking, but you're like a weirdo, right. that's like a, a double dub. So, uh, yeah. that's what I think on it. Jim sells. Good. Yeah. I tried to make this point. Um, to a certain guy on the haters episode of <laughs> of rule zero is that there is an incongruency there yes and so like i i was talking about like and i've always used this illustration i tried to use this illustration on rule zero but it was kind of stupid because i'm using it for guys who are basically autistic spurgs in the first place but mm -hmm. second of all is this is that if you see a guy who is just yoked i mean just i mean the guy looks like a bodybuilder like the guy i mean i'm not saying like huge but if he looks really it's good looking he has the v taper he's stereotypical like giga chad right mm -hmm. maybe not that level but let's just say knock it down you know to dial it back like two two notches and that's the guy right mm -hmm. if you see that guy in dressed up like a woman if you see that guy in a tutu right if you see that guy in a slingshot bikini or something at, at, at mardi gras or whatever like that throws you off that's what i was trying to explain with that whole illustration was this is that there is an incongruency women when they see a guy who looks good 
They expect a certain personality type from that guy. If a guy has tattoos and he looks like a, a, a death metal rocker, biker, you know, outlaw bad boy, they're expecting that to be your personality. They're expecting to be like, 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 what the hell? Right. You're broadcasting something. And so when guys tell me, they go, oh, it's all about looks. It's all about face. It's all about this. It's all about jaw surgery. It's all about, you know, getting, you know, implants in your pecs or whatever the hell it is. I don't know what the fuck they're doing right now, but it's all about looks, right? Ma looks maxing. It's like, no, that's only, that only gets you so far. That yeah. only gets a woman to go, oh, he looks interesting. He looks like arousing. I think I want to get with the guy. You get your point yeah. of in a day, in a day and age where we're, where women have nothing else to go on except for, for, for visual, you know, communication when they see the hot guy, who's like, like I've seen the, I'm sure you've seen this, the, the experiments where guys will go, Oh, I'm going to fit, make this fake Tinder account. I'm going to put giga Chad's face on there or something close to it. And I'm going to say, I'm like a pedophile. Or I'm going to say I'm something like a, a criminal or I've, I've, I'm a sex offender or something like that. And women will just still throw themselves at you. See, that's what's really happening. No, it's not. That's not what happens when you're in real life and you're in a club or you're in a social situation. They want to see that that, because they're living behind the screen, right? They're living behind the buffer that says, oh, this must be. And so that's where their data is coming from is just from one, one aspect. But if that guy, you take that same guy and you dress him up in, you know, a, a purple, you know, Mardi Gras outfit with a feather boa and he still looks like that, that broadcast, that's incongruent. There's an incongruency between those two. So when, when you're talking about like, uh, uh, Christian, when you're talking about guys who are quote unquote gym cells, the guys who are like putting in the work, but they're like still lack confidence. Usually those guys who are lacking confidence are not seeing sort of the, the feedback, I guess, because I, I, whenever I talk to guys who went from being fat to being fit to, to the guys who went from being sort of like a little chubby to losing that weight, to putting on some muscle, to, to getting, uh, you know, sh shredded down to a certain body fat percentage and whatever, then they start seeing women become more interested in them. It's that's and that's great. Usually what happens for a healthy adult male, if that's what happens, they see that and they sort of change their personality because now that's this is what women are sort of expecting from me because I look differently. And so what happens is they get rewarded for their looks with female attention. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about like guys who are like the quote unquote naturals, like the guys you used to know in high school who are like the, 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 usually they're the guys who are the athletes. They're the guys who are like the, the quarterback of the football team, the, the stereotypical jock, the guy who's lucky with the girls or something like that. There's no such thing as a really a, a natural per se It is that they are ahead of you in the game. So what happens is they're, they have an advantage. Yes. There's a genetic advantage. So maybe they were born, you know, more muscular or they have, they have an easier time of things or they, they just have that, that met more masculine look that gets them in the door. And what happens is women respond to that by rewarding that guy with attention. And so he's like, okay, well, if I do this, then I can get laid. If I do that and it's easier for that guy. Yes. But he's just further ahead than you in figuring those things out. So and maybe I'll say this too, because you talked about congruency and this is really important back to application, right? So um, you, you were in the webinar actually. So there's a guy in John's community. He shall not be named, but, um, he's getting girls on dates. He's a, he, his Tinder profile is good. He's in good shape. He has a good job. He lives in a, in a major city in a downtown area of a major city. So he's literally set up to win. Right. However, when he meets these women in person, he's not closing for some re weird reason. When he gets them back to his place, even though he has good pictures, he looked a good looking guy, successful, etc. And this guy, I had met him in person in, in Arizona. And, uh, you know, we had done some night game with each other. And the quick, the first thing I noticed was that he was like a little socially uncalibrated, really nervous and shy around women. And this is an example of lack of congruence. If you if your profile says a certain thing about you and you meet the girl in person and you, she doesn't see that, uh, if you don't walk it like you talk it, for lack of a better term, she's going to really get uh, she's she's going to lose attraction very quickly because she basically it's you're underwhelming what she thought you could be. And this and this led to him not being able to close as many girls on dates because his pictures were not congruent with what he was really like in person. And this is why I always say congruency is like literally it is critical, man, because I always say, if, you know, if, if the if flags in her head are red, you ain't getting head because women don't want to feel like they're being bamboozled. This is why, like, I know Rola used like the use the example, like if a guy says, I'm a lawyer, I'm you know, I'm a doctor, whatever. And then she finds out you're a Starbucks barista. She's probably going to meet to you. You know what I mean? And that speaks to how uh, seriously women take it when they're when they're um, yeah. bamboozled on your status or how much money you make or whatever. Though you're the same person, 
Nothing really changed. You look the same, whatever it may be. They're still going to probably come at your neck because you lied to them about your status. So this is why congruency is so important and that there's dire consequences from a sexual standpoint if you're not congruent in who you, in who you say yourself to be because women never, never want to feel like they're getting fooled. You know, typically they're the manipulators. Typically yeah. they're cognitively superior. Yeah, we're the ones that actually game the system, not you guys. It's yeah. your be honest and authentic with us. Yeah. I, I, that's, that's good. I, uh, I've got a couple of different, um, essays about the existential fear of women. Yeah. And what that is, is in our evolutionary past and our ancestral past, if a woman chose a bad guy to have sex with, that could be a matter of life or death. Yep. So it is within women's sort of like subconscious, like I, what I call, uh, evolved mental firmware, that she has to be, she has to have what she would call feminine intuition, but what I call uh, a the hypergamous filter, yep. meaning that she's trying to to filter for honest cues, like are you really who you say you are, and that really goes back to congruency right there as well, is that she's looking to see if you're really what you're about, and that's where like the the visual thing, like this, to see what you're all about, and then to experience what you're all about. If there's an incongruency between those two, if you're really like, if you're really buff dude if you look like the rock and you see you talk like this yeah you have that or you have a list or something that's incongruent with what her hindbrain is expecting you to be like because when you see that you figure a deep voice he's going to sound like barry white and he's going to really rock my world kind of thing when that doesn't happen that's when we get turned off now that's an easy illustration it's easy to say, okay, well, if, he, if, it's, if it's The Rock and he looks like he, you know, he looks like he's gay or he's he's got a list where he is incongruent, that we can we can figure that out. But now dial that back by order of degrees. So you don't look like The Rock, but you are authentic in whatever it is that you're doing. Your congruency is good. That congruency right there to what you look like and what you act like and what you like who you are, all of that is determined by women will say their feminine intuition, but it's that it's that hypergamous filter. And you're right, it is deathly serious for women because there's still that sort of evolutionary species level uh, fear that I mean the existential fear of women is this is that she would get into a relationship or she would breed she would she would get pregnant and have the child of a guy who she thought was alpha for lack of a better term who she thought was alpha and then later discovered that the guy was actually a beta and yep. aha we tricked you I'm I'm not actually alpha. I'm actually a beta, and it's either see you later or you just had the child of a, of a uh, a suboptimal man, right? And so and and now she's saddled with a child that she has to take care of for the rest of her life. Or maybe in the past, if the guy left, then that was a death sentence for that girl. So that's why it is so important. That's why it's so refined. You want to know why women can pick up on nuances and body language and communicate. They communicate differently and they can pick up on subcommunication so accurately. That's why it has to be honed because if they didn't, they died. Yeah. So, the, so when you talk about, and, and this, is, this will piss off a lot of like sort of the more alpha male guys is when you talk about game, and when we were talking about like the reason why we hate greasy kind of like, you know, mystery pick pickup artists is because they figured it out. They yeah. figured out how to do an end run, how to circumvent the, the hypergamous filter. So these guys aren't actually alphas. They're not actually people that these women should, they should know better. How come these girls don't know any better? And you have this sort of mate guarding, like uh, you don't even have to know the girl. You could just be like, you know, blue pill white knight and you want to go out there and protect milady's honor. The reason for that is, is because that guy figured out something you didn't. And now you do an end run around the, uh, the hypergamous filter, get in there, get laid. And, you know, we live in an age where we have birth control, but the, your, your, bra your body and your mind and your, your, your hindbrain doesn't know that. All you know is that this guy has the potential of reproducing with this girl because he tricked her. He's not actually authentic. He should be more authentic and be a real man and be. And it's like, yeah, but for women, perception is everything. I, and I'll say this, man: women never want to feel, you know, stupid. They basically like if you bamboozle a chick, like it, <laughs> it's going to be a problem, man. Like, like, because the thing is, is that um, her ability, just like you were saying, her ability to survive and replicate and thrive is basically it necessitates on being with a high value guy. So if you're able to basically what I say, J rig it and use a game shark and cheat, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, it's, it's, it's temporary. And then if she finds out women don't take L's very well, this is why if you reject the girl, I hate pickup artists, that's why they hate me because I, I 
the game. They, 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 women like don't really like, they, I always say women don't take L's well. Like if you break up with a girl or if you kick her out of your place or um, you reject her or anything like that, she's going to come at your neck. Like she's going to mess up your car. She's going to mess up your furniture or whatever it may be because women aren't used to being rejected like men are. For us, it's like a rite of passage. Like, you know, when you get rejected by a girl, it's like, all right, whatever. I failed with her. But it's like expected as a man. As a woman, however, they never really understand the, the pain of rejection or uh, not getting what they want. A lot of the times when it comes to intersexual dynamics, at least a lot of the times they're able to attract guys fairly easily without any type of uh, hindrance. But when they don't do it, that's mm -hmm. when problems arise and then you're going to deal with like the bad side of women. And that's why I tell guys, don't lie to chicks uh, and like and tell her, oh, you're the only one, baby. I love you, whatever, and get her emotionally invested yeah. in you. Because if you do that. She's going to really think that she's the only one. And if she finds out that you're cheating on her, that's when you're, you know, she's going to mess up your car and everything like that. Because when women make emotional investments, they don't know how to deal a lot of the times with being bamboozled because they're not used to being manipulated by men. They're normally the manipulators. Yeah. So if you run game better than a woman <laughs> and she finds out, it's it's never going to end up good. So yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, again, that's why women really hate the red pill or they really hate um, game. Is because it is guys who are who would I let's just say like figuratively speaking, relatively speaking, are lower SMV guys or lower guys who are actually you know faking it till they make it right, and so to get around that is uh, it's an existential crisis for women because they don't want to get pregnant with a guy who's like sort of a a, a blue pill guy. So when you see things like uh, like Carrie Underwood's uh, video about like before he cheats and she's like smashing up his his uh, his uh, four wheel drive truck and keying it and and like freaking out and throwing all his crap out the you know apartment window and all this other stuff. And women will women know women know that song word for word. Yeah, it's guys who won't say anything about it. And you know why? Because they're on board with women's existential fear. Because if a woman is doing that, if she's been brought to that point where the, the guy has betrayed her or is, is, is banging some other girl or something, or he's not who he said he was, and the, she's entirely justified to vandalize everything he's got to the point of where she can like just about kill the guy. I mean, just right up to the point of murder. She can beat him up and scratch his car and, and just do whatever she wants to. And guys will be like, uh, he, oh, he probably deserves it, right? And and so when we see oh. when we see violence, when we see violence towards men from women, we don't say anything about it. We won't call the police for that. If you raise your voice to a woman, that's when the cops show up. That's when they're like ten guys go, hey, hey, you better get over here. You know, <laughs> experiment on this where they had a guy with his girl, right? And the girl was beating on him in public, right? She was literally beating on him in public, and no one did anything, you know, because uh, like. When sure. I'm getting abused by his girl, like people automatically assume, well, he deserved it. He probably did something wrong. But when they reversed it and the guy screamed at her, right, and there was even an insinuation that there's going to be violence, guys immediately came and stopped it, called the police, whatever it may be. So, you know, and I, I this is so check this out too, because I talk about this a lot too with um, dealing with women. This is why I tell guys all the time don't invite a chick straight to your place um, that you don't know, you know, because you never know what these women are doing. A lot of people don't know this, but a lot of girls set you up to get robbed. And what I mean by that is they'll come over, they'll have sex with you, whatever it may be, or they'll drug you and they'll let two guys know and they'll come and jack you later on or they'll or she'll show up or she'll meet you at a hotel, she'll jack you. And this happens far more often than not. It's just that it never gets reported because men never want to be victims and and basically get made fun of for like, ha ha ha, you wanted to get laid, now you got you know beat up and robbed or whatever. So guys want to report it to the police. But it happens a lot. And it, it, the thing is, is that when I tell guys like you got to protect yourself because a lot of girls aren't going to be held accountable because people aren't going to go to the police. Then on top of that, women aren't held when guy when men are victimized by women. Women are typically aren't held responsible. Look at Cardi B; she's running around saying, "Yeah, I used to drug people and rob them." No one said anything about that. But if sure. it was the other way around, it would have mm -hmm. been a huge problem. You know, it would be the end of your career. Let me uh, let me get to some of these here real quick. Oliver says this. I like this one too because this is on my 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 notes today. It says, "Can an alpha male be?" Uh, can you be an alpha male without being a total jackass? Um, I, I I think that kind of goes back to like, what's your definition of an alpha male? Like what, what makes you alpha? What doesn't make you alpha? And I would say this, I think uh, when we talk about alpha males, most guys do have sort of like a, a stunted idea of what is an alpha guy and what is not an alpha guy. Or you'll talk to women and women will, they will always tell you that the alpha is more like Superman or, or Captain America instead of, Tony Stark, right? Instead of Iron Man or Batman, he's always he's always that guy. But they end up for for some reason they end up screwing Batman and and Tony Stark instead of, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, Captain America until they get to like maybe into 30, 31 years old. And then suddenly they find that that's more attractive. I think there's different sort of alpha archetypes, but I think what he's talking about is like, you know, chicks dig jerks. That's, yeah. that's pretty much a pretty much a given. Um, and I think, and I've, I've said this before, it's like, you don't necessarily have to become an asshole. You don't have to become a jerk, but you do have to harness sort of the motive, motive forces of what makes that guy attractive to like as an asshole what why is why are women attracted to assholes well because it's a dominant personality trait it's a dominant you know uh, why why is it that women are uh and it's only women why is it that women are only into uh you know convicted felons why will they like create fan clubs for you know brutal murderers while they're in jail and want to have conjugal visits with those guys why is it that prison guards have to be like female prison guards have to be separated from the male population because they tend to have relationships with the the inmates and they try to bust them out. So like, why is that? Well, because there's some instinctual, you know, hindbrain thing that women are attracted to when it comes to arrogant asshole jerks, because they show up violent because they show some sort of uh, quality about them that is protective. And, you know, well, he'll, he'll only kill guys. He won't kill me. Right. Yeah. He won't me <laughs> i'll fall in love with him but it's okay because i need a guy who can kick ass and take names and i'll, and I'll say this when it uh, to answer his question when it you know to when and when he says alpha i'm going to assume he means as far as like being attractive to women mm. i'll say this you don't necessarily have to be a jackass but you need to be able to do it within a moment's notice and what i mean by that is that um if a girl does some, because here's the thing when you deal with women they're always going to do stupid things that that, that like they're going to test your frame whatever it may be so you're going to need to be able to turn it on like that and let her know who's in charge right away. So you need to be able to res always reserve the right to be a jackass, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to exude that all the time. You just need to have it in your in your tool belt for when it's required. Now, as far as why are jackasses so attractive to women, my th thing is this. When you uh, – because when people say, oh, you're a jackass and, and like, or you're a jerk, when women say that, what that really means to me is I can't control you. And whenever a woman knows that she can't control you, that already infers that you're better than her because you're not going to defer to her authority, which means you're higher status than her and you're higher than her in general. And that's what women are attracted to, because if a woman knows she can't impose her will on you, it's going to make her even more attracted to you because that infers that you're better than her. And the thing is, is this women are attracted to men that are superior to them, whether they want to admit it or not. It's the reality. They want a guy that's physically superior to them, financially superior to them. Uh, you know, cognitively superior to them. They want the top of the top. This is why so many women are single because they're all chasing that top 1%. And, um, and the thing is, is that <clears throat> women, I think, innately know deep down that if you're going to deal with a high value guy, he ain't going to listen to you. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that's one of the consequences of dealing with a high value guy. But they, like I said, attraction isn't a choice. They love that because they know he's never going to defer to their authority. So that's what I think, uh, why women love jackasses it's not necessarily that they love jerks or guys that are rude no they just love guys that don't ever listen to them because them uh, that him listening to her infers that she's an equal which she's not right right that's a whole the, the whole equality thing and i i talked about this in the tommy laren video too because tommy laren was like just going off on the fact that she couldn't find a guy with his shit together right okay. I didn't, and it was always about like how come i can't find a guy who's single blah, blah. and she had like her six little criteria and stuff like that and i'm like I deconstruct that was actually a pretty good video for me, but um, I deconstructed it pretty well. But like, again, it's uh, I think it's a P Patrice O'Neill said this is like you ladies, you want a guy who's smarter than you, who's stronger than you, who's more who makes more money than you, who's better educated than you, who has, you know, all you has is essentially your superior is higher above you, but you want him to think that you're his equal. That's yeah. not. And so when when guys when guys like start throwing crap at me about like hypergamy, I'm saying, well, only women are hypergamous. Get that through your head, okay? Yeah. Because women don't want a guy who is their equal. If a woman, if you are a woman's equal, she cannot look up to you. Facts. Facts, facts of life, right? If she can't facts, look up baby. to you, then she is, you, you know, if you're her equal. And so women are not interested in equals. They're interested in betters. And at no other time in history have they been more interested in getting with the top 20% because they all think that they're entitled to that guy because... They have pretty much have accounted for all the beta buck side, all the provision. Was it provisioning, parental investment, and uh, protection? All that's, at least perceptually, women believe they've already got that or they're entitled to that. So what's left? The top 20% of guys who make more money than them, who are smarter than them, who are whatever. But we're supposed to say, well, we're in an equal partnership. 
Like when they're talking about how, how, how they can't find men who are uh, economically attractive and you look at the numbers of what they're talking about, they, they're, they're, and I, they did, they were, I think it was Forbes or Morgan Stanley did the, did the numbers on this. Women want a guy who makes 58% more than they make. So yeah. whatever they're making plus 58% more, that makes a guy economically attractive. That's hypergamy. They don't want to go below that. And I'm not just talking about one side. I'm talking like like the provisioning and, and parental investment side. I'm also talking about he's got to be better looking than her. He's got to be at least one step above her in sexual market value. He has to be the guy that other men want to be and other women want to bank. And if he's not, she's looking for that. That's She's always open to the opportunity as long as she can facilitate that. She's always looking for that opportunity. As long as her her variables make you know that guy less attractive or the or at equal, they're not looking for that. Guys are not hypergamous. They will get with a girl. They don't care if you work at Starbucks. They don't care if you as long as you're hot and you have you look good. It doesn't matter what your career choices were. It doesn't matter what your education choices were. In fact, the lower the better because you're the one that's looking for the guy that's actually above you. So there's that aspect. And then I also want to say this is that um, when we're talking about guys who are jerks or guys who have the potential for violence or why is it that only women get hybristophilia, which is the, you know, the they, they want to say, oh, it's only damaged women. No, it's only women who get hybristophilia. The reason for that is I, this is my theory. This is Rolla Tomasi spitballing here is that in our evolutionary past, in our ancestral past, the highest way a man could demonstrate higher value kill another dude <laughs> kill the rival that's gonna bang this girl oh yeah you know push him off and beat the hell out of him or make him either run away or kill him outright that is, and so what happens the woman gets attracted and aroused by that when you when you look at like uh when you look at higher order mammals like uh lions do this um higher primates like uh gorillas and chimpanzees and all this if th there's usually an alpha male that has a harem of girls or harem, harem of females and then what happens is when another alpha comes into that troop or comes into that pride alliance or whatever, and it deposes that, that alpha that's there, what he usually does, that, that ape or that, that lion goes in and he kills off all of the offspring of the previous, of the rival alpha that he just either killed or ran off. And what happens is it turns, it, it sets those females in that pride or that troop of, of primates, it, it sends them into estrus. It sends them at now they're hot. Now they want to now they want to have sex with the guy or the the male that comes in and kills off all the offspring. It's ugly, but that's the way it works. And so if you're wondering why women like guys who have a potential for violence, have a potential for I would I would say that this is I, I, again, I, I can't give you numbers or anything. I'm just like sort of connecting dots here. But I would say that the reason why women get attracted and get hot for guys who have a potential for violence is there's a protection factor. Yes. But it's also demonstrating higher value, and there's something about that guy that triggers that that arousal factor that I think is connected to the idea of like when an, or an alpha male comes in, takes over the troop, kills off the offspring, and sends that the females into estrus. And I'll say this because you mentioned Tommy Laren before, and this like is a glaring example of what I mean when I say no matter how successful a woman is, she's always going to want a guy that's higher value than her higher status. And like she was like make plans so even a woman right that subscribes to feminist ideals she's with jay cutler now <laughs> I mean, she wants to, she wants to be led by a strong dominant male this like it, 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 i always say attraction is not a choice and here's the other thing too rollo that you mentioned that i thought was very uh interesting as far as like women mating with the top 20 percent. i think women actually want the top 10 percent. and what i mean by that is there's a video on YouTube. It's 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 has like I think over a million views now. It's from a matchmaker named Rebecca Lynn Pope. If you guys want to search it, and she went on like a 40 minute uh, rant or no, excuse me, like a 20 minute rant where she spoke about women having unrealistic expectations of dating men, and she was a matchmaker for women, and she literally quit her job because she uh, women were just I guess uh, oblivious to like how rare the man that they're looking for actually is. And I actually have some fun with this uh, sometimes when I'll be on dates and I'll ask girls, what percentage of guys do you think are over six feet tall? Oh, like 30%. Okay, what percentage of guys do you think are over six foot two? Oh, like 15, 20%. And the reality is this, only 4% of guys are over six feet two and then uh, six foot two and then only about 14.5% uh, or so of people, of uh, men are over six feet tall. Then let's add on to that the fact that a woman wants a guy who makes over six figures a year. Then is he in good shape? Is he attractive? Then we quickly move into like the top 1%. So all the women truly want the top 1% guy. And what they don't understand is that there's consequences to wanting men like that. You're going to have to share them. But this is why I always say 
you know, women are fundamentally unaware of the plight of men. Like mm -hmm. they don't know wow. at all. <laughs> It's what's called the apex fallacy. It's yeah, like if they right. see that one guy and they see, oh, well, well, look, he gets all the girls, blah, 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 and they, they think that that's just like how all guys are. Yeah. They don't. And, and they, again, it goes back to the emotional connection rather than like a rationalization of things. Both guys are visible uh, to women. Simple, Simple Coder says this. This is a question for you. He says, Myron, what are your thoughts on getting LTRs, long term relationships nowadays? I get laid easy, but can't keep women. I don't. If I don't commit in two months, they ghost. I'm six foot three, 210 pounds, 27, making over $200,000 a year in uh, New York City. I'm like SMV eight, I'd say. Yeah, no. Um, huh. Yo, so first, the first thing you're going to internalize, man. Why do you want to get into an LTR in the first place, dude? Yeah, I, I'm just going to say that. Um, the first thing I always tell guys is you need to internalize this. She belongs to the streets. Unless proven otherwise, man. Because... The thing is, you guys got to understand is that like the average girl nowadays is have like that's that's uh, like if you take a 21 year old female, a 21 year old male, the 21 year old female is having way more sex than the 21 year old male, like way more. So the only way that you're really going to be able to get good with women and discern a woman that's worthy of a long term relationship versus a girl that's definitely not, which we're going to do an episode tomorrow, 10 signs that she belongs to streets on my podcast um, is that you're going to have to get out there and date more women. You really are. And, um, when you date more girls, you're going to be able to see patterns, trends. You're going to be able to see, okay, is this girl just trying to sell me purity? Is she really not worthy of a relationship? Whatever. So at 27, bro, living in New York city, like, unless you, you've, you've hooked up with at least like, I say bare minimum 50 girls, you shouldn't even be thinking about uh, a long-term relationship at your age with your, your kind of money. Because here's the thing, you're a meal ticket to a lot of these girls. So you need to move as such and protect yourself by getting more informed on the marketplace and figuring out how to deal with women. Because we can talk all day on here about how to deal with women, how to vet, whatever. But at the end of the day, you're still going to have to go out there and get that practical knowledge. Because the thing about game is that it's not black and white. It's very, there's a lot of gray areas. There's exceptions here, exceptions there. And you're only going to be able to truly fine tune your game based on practice and getting out there. So don't, don't, don't even think about doing an LTR, dude, especially in today's climate of a sexual marketplace. You're too young. These girls are, a lot of them are not worthy of an LTR if we're going to keep it 100. And you need to get out there and get more experience. So yeah. I, again, it goes back to uh, spinning plates, dating non-exclusively. Yeah stay that way for as long as like humanly possible right i i tell guys this when it comes to like ltrs or monogamy if you get into a situation where you have like four girls in your roster or whatever or maybe you got three or four or five whatever let's just say for sake of argument um and one of those girls is is sort of like your primary she becomes your primary if you get into a monogamous relationship it should seem like the the natural thing to do but also the last resort Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, OK, uh, you know, it, it seems like the, it should be so bloody obvious to you that that's that's where you're going to go with it rather than going. Hmm, if you're sitting there contemplating it, then, then don't just simply don't, because at 27 years old, you are still at least six, maybe seven years out from like really hitting your stride and having the sexual selection that you will have. If you maximize your potential later on, when you get to be 35, 36 years old, you will be in a better position and a better judge of character. And hopefully if you are still dating uh, non-exclusively, uh, you will have the experience under your belt to know what it is that you want and what you don't want. You'll understand women's nature better and you'll be ever able to make a better pairing for yourself if you decide that you want to be monogamous and you want to have a long-term relationship at 27 years old you are on the cusp right now where women are going to start looking at you like myron was saying as a meal ticket but primarily because if the girls you are going with are sort of your peer age girls let's just say they're anywhere between like say tw uh maybe one year older than you to like a year younger than you that's when they're starting to look for uh, for more like long-term security. They're looking for a guy who has $200,000 a year. They're looking for a guy who is a good, uh, maybe not like the winner at the end of the finish line, like Rich says, but is a good prospect to be that guy yep. later on. And they're hoping that you're still stupid. They're hoping that you're ignorant to the game. They're hoping that they that oh okay I found a guy who uh, who hasn't figured out that we're we're running a game on him and now we need to cash out and get off the carousel before the party's over and uh, you're still stupid enough to want to commit to an LTR. So my first question is this, and and this is something you, I, I'll, I'll just finish with this is that I think when guys tell me. Like they're like 27, 26, 27. They go, I want to get an LTR. I can't, I can't lock a girl down. How come I can't get anybody? I'm like, why do you want to? 
Yeah. Why is that? Like the question you need to ask is not like, how do I do it? It's like, why do I want to do this right now? Why am I not focused on my mission? Why am I not focused on my passion and my ambitions? Why am I not my mental point of origin? And you know how I know you're not your mental point of origin? Because you're asking about how to lock down a, yeah. a LTR. That's how I know. Here's another thing I want to add real quick. Guys, a pro tip of a girl that's not worthy of a long-term relationship, typically you guys got to understand that a woman's sex is her primary commodity. She, you know, Women don't just have sex with anyone. You know, Even though women are more promiscuous nowadays, they're still far more selective than 99% of men. So if you're having sex with these girls and they're ghosting you, right, right off rip, there's two things. One, you might just not be it for her, like sexually, but there's a bigger problem. Typically, if a girl invests in a guy sexually, he's going to want to see him again. Women don't want to feel like they're getting ghosted. You know what I mean? When after they, get, after they give up sex. So if the girls are ghosting you and they're not hitting you back, bro. She belongs to the streets. And she was never worthy of an LTR anyway, because most girls, right, even if the sex is bad, they're still going to try to leverage something from you, whether it's more time, more resources, more dates, whatever it may be, even if the sex is bad, because women don't like to just give up their sex without something in return. You know what I mean? Like they want some kind of uh, commitment or something from you. So if they're just having sex with you and not talking to you again, bro, that right there tells you she's she doesn't value her sex, which means she belongs to the streets, which means you shouldn't even be thinking about an LTR with these types of chicks, man. So that right there is a proof in the pudding in itself. Right. Uh, Bulldog, my, this is John Sonnes. He's He was saying this. Uh, congruency is key. Uh, everything can be faked except confidence because confidence is knowing who you are and being who you are at the same time. All right. Let me explain something here. I, I get what you're saying, but confidence, the behaviors, the manifestations of confidence are absolutely fakeable. So, and I will say, I'll, I'll explain to you why that is. Um, and this is a, a, I'll wait till Myron comes back, but let me put me, let me, put me back on here real quick. Um, so, and I'll tell you why it's fakeable. At least the, the behavior sets, the acts are fakeable. Uh, the, I think I've used this illustration before. There's this guy back in, uh, I think it was 2012, 2013, who was, uh, he would go to, these, these were just like social experiments. He would go to like malls. I think one of them was in New Jersey. And then he pulled this again in New York, where he'd go to these, uh, he'd go to these uh, places where, where people congregate, a mall, for instance. And then what, ha what happened is he'd be followed around by like a handler, like a guy who was supposed to be his like PR agent. And then he was followed around by like a guy who had like a, a video camera. And whether it was running or not was irrelevant, right? And so what he would do is he would go to shop to shop to shop. And then people started asking, um, they started asking, uh, you know, his handler, who is this guy? And the handler would say, oh, he's so-and-so from the latest Spider-Man movie, like John Jones or something like that. And they go, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And so they would start talking about that. And so people started congregating around this guy. Girls started coming up to him, wanting to get their pictures taken with the guy, uh, getting an autograph or getting a peck on the cheek or something like that, just so that they could say that they got a picture with this guy who is supposed to be, who absolutely easily faked this, this confidence this uh, the idea that the guy had pre-selection manufacturing pre-selection is easy. If you know, I mean, I'm not saying it's ethical, but guys do it all the time. In fact, just going out there and, and, and running game is manipulating uh, it, seduction uh, is, is, you know, people say, well, isn't that manipulative? Aren't you just playing games with girls? Well, that's, that's the whole game. That's the whole dance, man. You know, yeah. what, like, here's the thing. A guy, and, and air guys, man. yeah, so it's like, so and I, I know where you're going to go with it. Hold on a second. Yeah, I, know, I know where John's going to go with this. And John said, well, you know, it's, it's authenticity. you got to be a real man. And, and because if well, sooner or later, she'll figure you out. Yeah. But in the meantime, <laughs> you'll get around that. You won't get your foot in the door so that she can sort of make an emotional connection with you unless you are in some way displaying the higher value you're displaying uh you know traits and and behaviors and congruency with you know what you are so it's, it's like it's uh, one of the things i have to really sort of temper whenever whenever people talk to me like ask me questions about con congruency i say well that yeah it's great if you it's great if you can match your like the reality with the what what you're presenting that's a high valued man right to actually it's much easier to like a rich guy doesn't have to tell you he's rich. Okay. You can, you can see it like by the car he drives, how he acts, how he dresses, how, you know, what his mannerisms are and such, such and such. But it's, it's this congruency that like a lot of guys jump on board and then they want to pair that up with authenticity. It's easy to, to fake. In fact, there's a lot of guys that do it all the time. It's easy to fake because women are only interested in perception in the, in the beginning. 
then once you get into it and they want to, if they decide that they want to make an emotional connection with you, that's when it's important to actually have to be who you say you are. That's when authenticity is a real, is, is a real thing, but getting to that point, it's irrelevant. All you have to do is like, just be the right image, play the right character, be the guy that she wants to have that sexual experience with. And then we'll sort things out afterwards. Unfortunately, that's how we, we do it now. It used to be the other way around. It used to, prior to the sexual revolution, it was like, is he a good prospect for me? It was like women would be more interested in the provisioning side of, of hypergamy. They were more interested in like, well, where, what's his family like? Does he love his mom? Does he have a good job? Uh, is he educated? Is he refined? Is he, uh, does he know, you know, is, does he just get it right? That, that, that was a concern for women. They wanted a guy that was good looking for sure, but the priorities were different. Now the priorities have shifted because women don't necessarily need those things anymore. And they're more focused on the alpha seed side of hypergamy. That is for sure. Especially here in Miami, they're definitely looking for the alpha seed. I mean, the, the beta bucks does well here too. You know, if you got a boat and you, you know, you want to trick on chicks, you know, this is a prime city for like seeking arrangement, but yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of sugar babies that live here as well. Yeah. And sugar babies is another thing is that's, uh, you know, that's all transactional. We could do a whole episode on that, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, CEO lifestyle. Yeah, I think this is your point. This is perception is everything, which is uh, which I always say work on becoming the best version of yourself while working on the best authentic online presence. Okay. Like I, I don't have anything against authenticity. Whenever like guys tell me like uh, start, you know, preaching about authenticity, I have to sort of take that with a grain of salt because a lot of times what that is is it's just it, it's another form really of just be yourself or just be the best, just be your best self. And that's easy to say. But it's harder to sort of like nail down for each individual guy. That's why I don't do pres uh, uh, like prescriptions. I don't do 12 rules for life. I don't have some sort of template for guys to follow. There's some general things that guys need to do that are generally true for, you know, heterosexual, you know, men with a, a proper amount of testosterone in their bloodstream. But you, you know, for me to cater a, a game for you, Myron, in you know, as a as a black man in Miami, would be kind of ridiculous for me, right? But I can tell you the nature of women. I can give you the tools, and then you can take those and customize it for whatever for the life that you want to build for yourself. Yeah, no, I mean, um, and, and that's my buddy, uh, Fresh Prince CEO, man. You guys should definitely subscribe to him. He mm -hmm. he runs all his game through social media. Like he he's yeah. so his, he's the only guy I know that literally uses social media as like his primary. Uh, sourcing method, which is like really difficult because to get women strictly off Instagram, you have to be in the top, like, uh, you know, top 5%. So that's, and it's like, you know, we do a podcast on Thursdays together where we basically like, cause we have our different specialties, but like we're able to combine them and, and do a show for the guys. But, uh, but no, I agree, man. It, it's definitely your, your, your marketplace is going to dictate how you, how you approach things. But like here in Miami, for sure, it's very competitive and there's a lot of tricks out here, especially right. with the dating scene, like the neighborhood I live in here, Brickle. This is like mm -hmm. of Miami and there are so many girls that live here that like you can tell they're sponsored by a sugar daddy. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> and it's tough. And it, that's fine. This is really a good question. And she, this is not super, but this is good. Uh, she says, but where does that leave traditionalists <laughs> that leaves you in the epiphany phase or is where that leaves you. But uh, women that still believe in being a helpmate, helpmate, help me, whatever. Uh, I feel like I'm caught between two worlds. Yeah, I'm sure you probably are. And, uh, Especially in an age where the in in 2020, I just was reading about this. The top career choice for girls entering into college, a community college, is to become rich off of OnlyFans. That is the top. They don't care. Like it, no longer do women really care so much about getting into communications or psychology or sociology or journalism or whatever. How can I make a shit ton of money on OnlyFans? <laughs> because it seems like a whole lot better. I mean. Think about it this way. I would say OnlyFans. I mean, if you're like when I was looking at that one girl who was making a hundred thousand dollars a month, and she like I said, she's maybe on my scale, she's about seven and a half. I mean, she's yeah, she's pretty, but she's not like she's not she's not like Miami, a South Beach beautiful, okay? Mm -hmm. But she seems attainable, and that's what her real key is. She's sexual, obviously. She still does the sex stuff side side of things. She sends nudes and all that. But for the most part, I think she has this look. That makes guys go, yeah, I could get that. She seems like somebody I, I could really relate with, right? And that's why she's super successful about it because there's that connection aspect. So like what you and I are talking about is like sort of formal game, like in in the clubs, uh, in like, I don't say just about clubs because game is a whole lot more than just like a club game. I mean, there's, there's, you know, what is it? Street game or, you know, day game, 
uh, a college game, uh, yeah. store game, whatever game, a Bible study game. I don't, whatever it is. I mean, it's like wherever you're meeting girls, there's always some kind of there's some sort of game that you're if if you're want to get with a girl that's in that. you, Rolo, like more and more like you you would be sh like there are so many women on only fans right now it is crazy like oh, yeah. especially here in miami like if you run into a girl that's like super hot nine out of ten chance she's gonna probably be on only fans like you know mm -hmm. especially like in these major cities like you know and i don't knock them you know they're gonna make money because most guys let's let's keep it real most guys are suckers they're gonna pay to mm -hmm. look you know boobs or whatever it may be and i always say it's not that guys pay necessarily to see uh, tits and ass because you can just go on on the internet and watch that. The reason why guys are paying is because just like you said that um, you know she has that next uh, next girl from next door type vibe. Like this girl is attainable, and then if you're able to get attention from a girl that's attractive like that, that has that next door vibe, and she's attainable to you, you're gonna buy into that fantasy more. I always say guys don't necessarily spend money on OnlyFans or on strippers or whatever because they're trying to like well obviously sex is a part of it but they enjoy the attention from an attractive woman actually giving a you know, giving a crap about their life that's what they like they like the attention this is why like the tates are millionaires you know what i mean off of uh webcam chicks because these webcam girls are able to get in these guys heads and sell that purity of oh daddy you're the only one aka purity oh i'm i'm down, nice and down to earth you know being human uh you know humble these are all things that like a lot of modern day women that are attractive don't exhibit so when these women are able, these women are able to exhibit this to a stranger on a camera, right? They're like, "Oh, this fantasy is awesome," and that's what they're paying for. They're paying for that fantasy and for that um, attention from an attractive girl that seems attainable. That's how they became millionaires. With the uh, yeah, well, exactly. Um, and then uh, you know, getting back to what SD was saying, SD was saying here is like, yeah, if that's what you want to be, what I would suggest that if that's where you feel like, I I, I feel for you because I know that there's still some girls out there who still want to be like, I just. I don't want to be a housewife. I want to have kids. I want to have something that's a little bit more traditional. Good for you, but you yeah. have. I would. Gosh, I could almost do a program about this for like for for like women. Uh, I've I've written a, I've written one essay called an essay for women, and in that it's like a lot of women found that really super offensive. But all I was doing was saying, look, here's like here's the reality of of the sexual marketplace that you are in right now. Yeah. You have really basically two choices. Uh, you can be a sugar baby. You can be a prostitute. You can be an open prostitute. Let's just call it what it is. It's prostitution. So sugaring is prostitution. Sex work is prostitution. OnlyFans is prostitution. Even if you're not having, even if you don't even never take your clothes off, you're still selling the prospect. You're still selling the uh, the potential that you could be sexual with these guys. You're you're essentially selling prostitution. Um, like stripper being a, being a good high paid stripper, which I, I think is sort of a career that's starting to fall away right now because yeah. it's easier to simply sit at home and you'll make more money on OnlyFans than you could having some guy throw dollar bills at you or twenty dollar lap dances. So why you know why do that and why pay club fees and why go and deal with all the degenerates in those clubs when and live in person when you can just do it simply where you're at. That's that's choice number one. And then there's like, you know, okay, well, and I hate to say this because a lot of guys will say, well, women need to have respect for themselves. Well, do the women who are like making a like money hand over fist, do they have respect for themselves? I would say so because they're making a lot of money and they're making the most of it. Like, it's like, what is it? Don't hate the game. You know, don't hate the player, hate the game. That's, that's the game. And so, you know, you say, well, women, they're, they're immoral. They're unethical. They're, they're not wholesome. Okay, fine. Then look for another girl, look for that traditionalist. And if that's you, my, my advice to you, SD is this stay hot. <laughs> Don't get fat. Yeah. <laughs> And where you are right now, because there's guys that are looking exactly for you. They want to get, they don't want, they, they want the wholesome girl. They want it so bad. They'll pay her a hundred thousand dollars a month for the idea that they might be able to attain that whole, that quote unquote wholesome girl who's still kind of a little bit slutty or a little bit sexy, but they're not, you know, I think a lot of guys will say, uh, I'm looking for a virgin bride. I mean, beware of those guys. If a guy is that unrealistic about like how I want to, I want to make sure I've got my my perfect little virgin girl and and who's you know untouched and unspoiled. Every guy wants that. But you know what? You know what else? Every guy wants a slut. He just wants her to be his slut. Do Do we know how old she is, Rollo? I don't. I do not know. Mm. I, I, don't, I don't even know if that's her real picture. But I. I but she. she that's. I, that's a common. Uh, a common question I get from girls, like particularly red pill girls. Or these quote unquote red pill women, uh, and usually they've already got like a kid from another. Like they, they've, I've decided to turn over a new leaf, and uh, now I'm going to get right with God. And now I'm 31 years old, and I need a guy who's a, 
you know, hard work and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> real, quick, real quick. Um, so I, as you guys know, I said earlier, I have a sister, she's in med school, right? She's uh, about a year younger than me. And I had a talk with her about a year, year and a half ago or so. And I told her, listen, you know, as you become more and more successful and you make more money, you got to understand this. There's going to be consequences to that. And the thing, and she was at the time, I think she was like 27. I told her, listen, you need to settle down while you're still young and attractive because once you get older and you make more money, your ability to get a higher and higher value guy is going to be tougher and tougher. And these high value guys that you're going to be chasing that are going to be in the same one percentile that you are from earning potential are not going to be looking for you. And she was like, like she didn't like to hear it, but she was like, damn, you're right. You know, so I would say, you know, the same advice I gave my sister to any women that are watching this, understand that the more money you make, the more successful you become your pool of suitable candidates that will satisfy your need to be with a, a man that you feel is wor worth it, worth a damn is going to become severely diminished. So, and, and it is what it is. You know, you just got to understand that there's consequences of being successful and it might hurt your ability to, to get romance or a relationship in right. the future with a guy you actually want. Right. Exactly. And I was, I should also say this is like, I don't want my daughter on OnlyFans. Now, my daughter could very easily make a shit ton of money on OnlyFans and she wouldn't have to take her clothes off to do it, but I don't want her on OnlyFans. And I'll tell you why is because that is, I don't think women, uh, young women today really can wrap their heads around this because there's so much money flying around. Yeah. They can't wrap their heads around the idea that they're leaving a digital footprint. Yes. So all that stuff doesn't go away. And so long as we have the internet, so long as we have, so as long as it's somewhere, like the internet never forgets. So if you, if that's the, what you decide to do as a woman, when you're like 22, 23 years old and you're making a hundred thousand, like a lot of women will say this. I, if I were to say this to that girl who was making a hundred thousand dollars a month, she'd be like, fuck you. I got a hundred thousand dollars. I got, I have fuck you money, you know, like 2 million bucks. Well, I have the money to just sort of say, well, I can do whatever the hell I want. And she probably could, if she's smart she, and she socks it away and she, you know, uses it and invests it and, and does whatever, you know, is, is a wise steward of money when, when it comes to the money that she's got, then yeah. But I would, I would argue that, I mean, she's in the elite level. So not every one of these girls is making a hundred thousand dollars a year, but they see that and they go, look, this girl's not even that pretty. I'm prettier than her. I can make at least that much. And they jump on and they make more money than they would with a degree. They make more money than they would as a clinical psychologist who got, goes to school for eight years. And at the end of those eight years, she's less attractive than she was when she started school. And she can't really go back and do that. She gets out. She's got she's got to start her own practice, got to make her own business and do this all, all this other stuff. And then realize that there's some little girl out there who's, you know, there's what Belle Delphine making, you know, millions and millions of dollars just sitting there like doing all eggs or selling jars of bee, right? And I, that has to be really galling. That has to be really frustrating. It's like, why would I bother? It's no longer, remember that, what's the old joke is like, it's like the girl who can't do math. She goes, ah, screw it. I'm going to be a stripper. Now it's screw it. I'm going to be an OnlyFans girl. The girl I date right now, Rolo. She's actually, I'm going to hang out with her today. She makes 10K a month off webcam. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? We talked about it. You know, I might actually bring her on my uh, channel and we'll discuss it. But like, yeah, she's she's she does pretty well and there's guys that pay for it, man. I mean, I'm not going to knock her hustle, but like there's, I've dated a bunch of girls that like, you know, they, they do only fans or they were former strippers and they don't have work now. So they're doing whatever. And it's just like, there's a demand for it, man. These simps are paying. So it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. I talked about this with Sterling Cooper on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, was it, uh, the Bella Thorne episode. And that should show you just how easy it is to game that system. Cause I mean, she, uh, granted, she was making money off of her, her actual real celebrity and guys, thirsty guys were happy to pay her uh, literally $2 million in the space of about 36 hours because she promised them one, <laughs> she probably like nudes and gave them like one, like black and white boob shot. Right. And that was it uh, that, that she fulfilled. That's fulfilled. That was a nudes. Here you go. And okay. roll with the nail on the head earlier when you said that, um, Guys want a girl that's like almost attainable. She has a very um, girl next door look. You know oh. what I'm saying? That's why she's so successful? Like, like she has a nut, like one of those looks. So I'm not surprised because, like, when I looked at, it, I was like, "Yo, this chick isn't even hot." But in the back of my mind, I live in Miami. Obviously, the girls here are top one percent. But mm -hmm. for her, middle America, that type, that look, you know, she appeals to a wide demographic of men, and she has that girl next door look. So she was definitely able to monetize that. And then being in Disney, you know what I mean? That's obviously going to give her a little bit more clout as well where guys would want to see her naked because they probably might have watched Disney growing up and whacked off to her or something like that. So, Well, I mean, she has the Emma Watson effect, right? Every, every, when Emma Watson was in, uh, was it Harry Potter? 
Like yeah. Emma Watson, I think she is, she might still be. She was, she has the dubious honor of being the celebrity that has had her face photoshopped onto more porn, like porn pictures than any other like celebrity because they, people like guys, like horny teenage guys really, really wanted to fantasize about her getting it. Right. And of course, now she's like this short haired feminist who's, you know, like he for she or say hashtags and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's the there's that element of it as well, which is like uh, the coming of age sort of fantasy of these guys. Man, I can't wait till she's 18. I can't wait till she does porn at 18. Like, uh, <laughs> you don't think she's going to do that, but that's where their heads are at. I'll tell um, you that because um, the, some of these girls that I date that do OnlyFans or whatever that make this kind of money, guys, they're laughing at these dudes. Like, they, they're like they are just sent a, fo- a feet pick and I made $500. These guys are whack jobs. Like, they'll laugh and send me the message. My you know? pay pigs, yeah. You know? uh, let's see. Simple Coder says, how do you keep girls interested long term if you want to make your time before you – if you want to make your time before you commit? I like to vet them for six months, but must women – want to lock me down much quicker than that most uh, i think he said most most women want to lock me down quicker than that so he's saying yeah how do you keep a girl interested long term if you want to take your time before you commit i mean dude you, you just this is what you do you you see the girl and we're gonna do a um an episode on the podcast probably next week on this on like how to deal with uh with harems and and plates and everything like that but one of the things is you don't want to see her too often you know what i mean you need to you know scarcity builds value so you need to see her no more than once per week and uh, when you do see her, obviously, you know, if she's a girl that you like and she's worthy, then, yeah, take her out to dinner, do something cool with her, do a cool activity, like give her that little taste of the boyfriend uh, treatment uh, one day a week. And then that's going to keep that, number one, it'll keep you on her mind. Number two, it'll keep her also at ba- distance because, like, you don't want to spend more time with her and get attached. And then mm-hmm. number three, she's going to yearn for you more. So um, those are some ways that you could do to, you know, as far as like plate management. But I would say don't. Try, don't see her more than once per week, especially if you guys live in the same city. She lives far away and she's visiting you. Okay, maybe a weekend. But if she's like lives in the same city as you, dude, never more than once a week. And the other thing is ha- spin more plates. Facts. Yes. Spin more plates. That's- women in line. <laughs> women in line when they know you have other women in line. Always right. remember that, guys. Right. And and the other thing is when you are spinning plates, never give any one plate the perception that you are exclusive with that plate. Yes. And okay. Rolo. Okay. Again, theory and application again, literally just today, a girl that I'm dealing with right now, she sends me a message. She doesn't like that. I don't message her enough. And I already know what she's doing with that. She wants to start to angle to try to get me exclusively. I'm not going to do that. And the the reason why you guys can't lie to her and tell her she's going to be the only one or actually get, let her think she's the only one is because once you let a girl know that she's going to be the, your sole source of sex, you're going to take an L. Because then she's going to start to withhold it from you to, mm-hmm. and for some kind of compliance. And that competition anxiety is gone. And this is why Rolo, I agree a thousand percent in his book. He says, don't move in with a woman. And the reason why you don't move in with a woman is because now she's going to be able to see where you're at. She's going to know your actual real options. And that competition anxiety is going to be gone. Women always behave better when they know they can be replaced. And, and that's how it's got to be for you as the guy, because mm-hmm. your only weapon as a man is your attention and the ability to retract it when she doesn't behave. So if you stay with her or she knows she's your only source of sex, you best believe, man, that disrespect is coming very closely behind it. So you you never let a girl try to bully you because they will, you know, especially if you're a high value guy, they're going to try to bully, bully you to get exclusive time. Have you call them, whatever the hell it is. No, it's your way or the highway and you don't give her what she wants. She's going to she's number one, she's going to respect you more for it. And then number two, it's going to let her know that she's expendable. And I always say guys need to treat women just like women treat men. Women, guys, treat men as expendable commodities. Whether you want to accept it or not, or a girl will never tell you that, but she treats men, uh, most girls, especially hot girls, treat guys as expendable commodities. If you don't believe me, that's why she leaves you unseen. This is why she doesn't respond to your text. This is why she flakes without telling you. Women innately treat guys expendable in the dating game. You need to adopt that same mentality with them because the thing is a lot of guys are brainwashed to think, oh, I'm going to have some kind of integrity. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have honor with women, you know, relationship equity, all this crap. And the thing is this, you guys got to understand that women are taught you're as a man, you're taught do what's right. Women are taught do what's right for you, especially when it comes to dealing with the opposite gender. So with that said, you need to adopt their same dating principles and use it on them. And that means making them expendable, not giving them what they want and never letting her know that she's the only source of, uh, of sex. Because if you let her do that, she's going to start to leverage it against you in return for some kind of compliance. And you cannot allow that. I think another thing is that a lot of the, and I, I just had 
thank you rugby for this stat i think it was you that gave me this but i just came across some uh like a, a bar graph or a, a, some statistics that show that 18 well, they the uh in 2020 uh 52 percent of people i don't know male or female 52 percent of them still live with their family or their their they live at home, right? Between the ages of 18 and 29 right now. Mm -hmm. I would, I would argue most of those are probably the, probably guys, probably the dudes. Um, but so between 18 and 29. And so I, I think a lot of the times when we talk about, when we talk about stuff like this, or we talk about game or we talk, about, I think one of the reasons why, um, black pill or doom pill or MGTOW, I think one of the reasons all that stuff is very popular right now is because, they're like, like you and I are speaking a foreign language right now. Like, why yeah. would you ever want to do something like that? Or all these girls, like you were just saying, like the girl that you're going to see makes like ten thousand dollars a month or something off of, of yeah. only. Phones. She's probably has her own place. Yeah, <laughs> she's, probably, she's probably looking for a guy who is above her pay grade. She's probably looking for the guy who's the bigger, better deal. She's looking, you know, it's hypergamy. She's looking for the guy who makes more money than she does. Mm -hmm. well, Fifty by statistics, statistically speaking, she's not going to find that guy. Uh, fifty-two percent of the time, because that those guys are probably st still at home with mom and dad, because you know, they'll cite economic reasons or whatever reasons. But what I see happening right now is, as women make more money off of their sex, as it becomes easier for women to make more money off of their sexual agency, um, you're going to more and more women are going to be frustrated by the fact that they can't find that guy who who is better than them. So really what I, and you want to know why and I can't blame some of the looks maxer guys because this is really true is a lot of guys are starting to get into looks maxing or they're getting into like I got I have to be like the I don't care what she looks like she makes a lot of money she has these really high expectations I got to look the part because I can't be the guy I can't authentically be the guy who makes a lot of money because she's making way more money than I can because she's 22 23 24 years old and she's making ten thousand dollars a month on OnlyFans. yep yeah and this girl does it through webcam and so um yeah man I, the thing is like as women make more and more because women are earning men in a lot of uh, US cities now like as that continues and I think you had talked about this one year um broadcast well was that like uh, by in the next 20 years or so, like over 50% of women are going to be single. And, and I, I see it right now. I can already tell right now when I see like successful girls that make like over six figures, n a lot of the times they're just single. Like they just can't find a guy that like, you know, <laughs> that, because, I, because our, our, our evolved nature doesn't change. Like I, what, what gets me is this is if a guy can't find like the, the perfect hottie, if he can't find that eight, like, let's just say you've got a guy who's, it makes a good chunk of change and he has standards, right? A guy's men are not allowed to have standards in 2020. We're not, we're simply not. Fact. And, and so like when, when rich Cooper goes and puts out like six things that can make a woman more attractive to a guy, women just lose their so nuts, man. It, it, it makes it literally in some cases it makes the six o'clock news. I have seen those tweets make the six o'clock news. Yeah. And, and so men are not allowed to have standards. We're not allowed to say, I want a girl who is sweet and feminine and hot, takes care of herself, uh, gives me blowjobs on demand, makes me steak, blah, 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 you know, live that, that kind of stuff. And it sounds like it's horribly misogynistic, but yet we have Tommy Laren or girls like Tommy Laren who are making money hand over fist, who are in, in a position right now where they can't find guys who are above them in, you know, status or station or whatever. And we don't tell them, Girls, you need to lower your standards. Yep. We'll tell men that, but we won't tell women that. And the reason why we won't is because we understand women's nature. We, I think on a, on a hindbrain sort of like visceral level, we understand that women should be with a better guy. They should not lower them st themselves. They should not. If you, if you make a lot of money, uh, the only thing, the only reason why you should be with a guy who's a garbage man or, you know, is, is makes less money or is lower status than you is because he's got a nine inch personality or he's really yoked and he's fun to, you know, he's a, he's an alpha male physically and maybe mentally because he's not going to ever be able to compete with that woman on a financial way, but we don't tell women to lower their standards. If anything, we tell them to stick to those standards. Women, women are, women are never, uh, you know, they're completely applauded for being entitled to feeling that they deserve. Cause if you look at a woman's laundry list of what she wants in a male, it's typically somewhere within the top 10%. And this is why that woman I talked about, if you guys are interested, watch her rant. It's hilarious. Uh, Rebecca Lynn Pope. She talked about women having unrealistic standards, million views. She quit as a matchmaker because the women were just like all these women were chasing like the, the top 1% of men that she was just like, 
boo, he ain't going to look for you. You know what I'm saying? And it was just hilarious to see her get mad because like basically being a ma- <laughs> being a matchmaker, red pilled her. It was hilarious. So, yeah, man. It, but if you're if you're a man and you have standards, like I say sometimes I don't like fat girls and like girls will try to shame me. Oh, my God, whatever. And I'm like, OK, but you want a guy that's tall, right? You know what I mean? Like if a girl asks me on Tinder, oh, how tall are you? I'll be like, OK, how much do you weigh? You know what I'm saying? And they'll get mad. Yeah. <laughs> Because you're not because you're not allowed to have standards, and yeah. but you're supposed to be like above them in status. Uh, Andrew here says uh, a thought: young women find themselves in possession of a high value and perishable asset, the sexual agency, that they did not earn. Yeah, okay, yeah. M- women are men must become. Uh, I wouldn't say earn because the hot ones have to still have to stay in shape. Like the women who actually make an effort to stay hot. Yeah. But, in but remember there's like fat cam models too, that make money. Uh, in that situation, many humans would make poor decisions without good modeling. Yeah. Because they, again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. What, what is the incentive for women to educate themselves? What is the incentive for them to crack a book? Right. What incentive is there for them to be any more than just like, a cam model and and play the game very well. There's a, a, like, <laughs> I think it was Tom Likas who said this. He says, you know, the reason why fat girls are so smart is because they have, they have no other, ins- like they are not going out and doing their nails or having fun in the clubs or anything because nobody got, wants to get with them. So they've got a lot of time on their hands to go and, and develop themselves in other ways. Really pleasant. Okay. So I'm, I'm, you might think I'm like a lot of guys, Oh, you're beating up on girls. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this, is that's what you, as a guy, if you, if you've decided that you want to be in the game, if you decided that, you know what, I, 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 I want to get out there. I want to learn pickup. I want to learn game. I want to be red pill. I want to, I want to be able to, you know, have re- actual sex with that actual woman. Uh, if you want to be in that, this is what you have to prepare yourself for. This is what you like. Be ready for that. One of the reasons why I wrote pause, or uh, preventive medicine is so it could give guys a, a roadmap, right? Here's a timeline of what you can expect of women when they're 18, when they're 23, when they're 27, when they're 29 through 31, when they're in their 30s, when they hit the wall, when they're in their 40s. What are you? What is it that you can look at? I mean, basic things. I'm not talking about, oh, every woman will be just like this. That's not yeah. what I'm saying. Jake, these are just general things that you could consider when that time comes or like the guy, for example, the guy who's 27 years old and he's like, I'm dealing with these women, blah, 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 blah. I want to have a LTR with them. Okay. Crack open preventive medicine and say, well, where is she? Where is she in the timeline? What is she looking for? Because women's priorities change when they're like, when they're 22, 23 years old, they're not looking for long-term secure. They're not looking for a, they're not looking for a husband, especially if they're hot, the hottest ones, the ones that you want to get with, they don't, they don't want a long-term relationship. They want to get with the guy who's like the fun guy. They want to explore their options. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll just say this too. After you're doing the law. Go ahead. I just wanted to add on to something. Oh, you were good? Okay. Go ahead. Um, no, what I was going to say was just to, I want to double down on what you said and why it's so important for men to understand, um, you know, the, f- the female thought process as she, as, as she moves on through her life and, you know, she changes her priorities as far as mate selection goes. The thing is, a lot of guys, when you hit 27, 28, 29, like the guy earlier from, from New York City, you know, trying to angle for a long-term relationship, a lot of guys make the cardinal mistake of thinking their mating timeline is the same of that of a woman. And what mm-hmm. guys don't understand is that, like, their family's going to pressure them to get married, their friends are going to pressure them to get married, their, you know, relatives, whoever it may appear, co- co-workers, whatever. Once you hit late 20s, 30s, they're going to tell you to mate select like a woman. Hey, you need to start settling down. You can't keep running around, all this other stuff. In and, my game. A guys, <laughs> and a lot of guys like fall into the trap of thinking that they're on the same timeline as a woman. And I think the biggest thing that guys need to understand is that you shouldn't even be thinking about taking a girl serious until you're at least 35 years old or older and you have a certain notch count. Because the, the thing is, is that I, I tell guys, I say 50. You need, you need to be at least 50 because even though that's like the bare minimum, that's not really that much. It'll at least uh, you, at least you'll have a decent grasp of how women operate, how they deal with the opposite gender, so you can be better informed. So that when a girl does come to you and try to angle for a long term relationship, you're able to detect um, things that would otherwise disqualify her from a, as a long term relationship counterpart. Because make no mistake about it, a lot of these girls are more promiscuous than you think, and they're going to sell you purity. So you need to get out there and date women and figure this out. And it's going to take time because. Unlike women, we take a lot longer to become attractive. The things that make a man attractive take time to accrue money, status, confidence, et cetera. So you can't afford to be on the same dating timeline as a woman because she's going to use that 
to try to shame you. Hey, you need to marry me, whatever it may be, because she's banking on the fact, just like Rolo said earlier, she's banking on the fact that you're too stupid to realize your potential as a man. And I always say a 35 year old guy, like right now, John from Model Life Dating, shout out to him. He's killing it right now. He's doing excellent with financially, with the women, everything like that. He's at his peak right now. He's the equivalent of a 21 year old hot girl. So, but mm-hmm. he understands his value and he's not committing to any of these chicks. And that's the way it should be. Just like these hot 21 year olds aren't committing to you because they're getting flown out by rappers and they're traveling and they got a sugar daddy, all that other stuff. You need to apply that same mentality when you hit your stride at 35 and don't let society try to shame you and tell you, you need to settle down. No, fuck you guys. You, you guys don't know your own value. You know what I'm saying? So, all right. Yeah. All right, so we're at the two hour mark. I wanted to get to one last thing here. Sure. And Thing. I've, I've seen this all over in the chat and of course everybody says well what about the lo-? like we even just fielded one of these questions which is like what about the long term what about when you want to settle down what about what about family what about starting what about finding a wife what about uh you know uh what is it fertility rates right what about uh, saving saving the west uh and i think a lot of guys will the one of the biggest problems i think that like sort of traditionalists or guys who who are really stressed sort of authenticity and and confidence and everything else is their 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 main thrust of that the reason why they they really want to to promote that is because there's something that really promotes them to be like you know at some point you got to settle down you can't be like Rouge forever right you can't like because you'll turn you'll turn into you'll be insane at 40 and and turn into some hermit in the in the woods and be some weird branch of christianity right um <laughs> But I mean, there's, there's uh, like for me, for instance, for me, like my daughter was born when I was 30 years old. I can't imagine having a child at well, certainly not at 50, but, but like at, even at 40 years old, like there's things that you should be getting to at 40 that you can't really get to if you are, you know, if you've got two young children and you're going to live a different lifestyle as a result of that. So I understand that guys, I, I, I fielded this one question about, um, uh, you know, what, what about kids? What about set? What about settling down? What about, um, you know, the, the long term? and shouldn't that be a priority? And I'm like, well, yeah, it is. It should be a priority at some point. Um, you can't play the game forever. Right. But I think what most guys want to do is they want to sort of, it's like crabs in a bucket. They, they can't play the game. So they want to pull you back down into the, into the bucket with them so that you'll settle down. Like, it's like, all my friends are getting married. I guess I better get married too. And it's, I, I think like, I'm not against marriage per se. I'm against the way we do it now, but I'm also against the idea that you get into a, you're, you're making a choice, a, a life changing choice for yourself, for any future children, for your family, for her family, everything else based on ignorance. Yep. And I think that if you yeah. know, like, when I talk about like spinning plates, it's usually has, a, there's a, there's a specific end to that which is you get to a point where you understand women's nature and you're non-exclusive and you've had the experience with women so that you understand the, the game that you're playing. You get to a point of, of like your peak selection. Hopefully that's right around 35, 36 years old. And then you decide that, okay, this is a person that I want, even if you don't want to get married, but you want to say, okay, I want to have, a, I want to have kids. This is the person that I'm going to have kids with. At least you're in an educated position. You're not ignorant and stupid like the way that women would like you to be when you're 30 years old and they're cashing out while you're on your ascension to your yep. to your peak years. And and what I'm saying is that I'm not saying that it's not important to do that. I think it's very important for you to do that if that's what you want to do. If you want to have children, if that's in your future, that's what you've decided to do. And I and yes, I I answer this question like people like I some girl asked me this. She said, "Do do men have um do men have like a, a, a paternal instinct, right? Do men really want to have kids like this in the same way, I guess that women do. And I was like, well, I thought about it for a minute and I go, well, we have paternal instincts. Like we make guard. We will definitely make guard. Um, we, uh, we want to know that the child is ours. We don't want to get cucked. We don't want to be cuckled. Yeah. That's the whole, that's the whole thing. Because if you're going to invest in one woman and say like, okay, I'm not going to bang other girls. I'm not going to do any of this. I'm forsaking all others. I'm going to marry you. I'm exclusive to you. There's only one catch. The kid is my damn kid. Yep. That that's the one caveat I have, you know, and, and stay hot. Right. And, and bang me. Right. But like the kid has to be my kid. Yep. And even now we can't really even like allow that way. It's like, oh no, no, you got to be as you got to step up f- and and take over for single mommies and all that. We'll, we'll promote the idea that paternity shouldn't matter, but it does biologically. It does, but because of that. 
because we have a mate guarding instinct, because we have a paternal instinct, because we don't want to get cucked, because though like our existential, the existential fear of men is to get cucked, basically yeah. to take all of your reproductive efforts, put it into one, invest it in one woman, and have it be a waste because you're raising some other man's genetic progeny, you know, his, his offspring yeah. instead of your own. So I do think that men actually do want to have kids because if we didn't, we wouldn't care. We wouldn't give them. Yeah. I don't care. Go ahead. I'll just go nail whoever I want to and it won't make any difference to me and I'll never get jealous and I'll never make guard and blah, blah, blah. No, we do. We have an instinct that says, I want to have kids. I want to see children of my own. I want to raise them. I want to send them off into the next generation kind of thing. So yeah, there is something about guys that once that you're, you're eventually – you know, you're, you're, you're playing the game long enough until you can get to the point where you can make an informed decision. You can have a better judge of character and you can select better. So it's not all about perpetuating this. Oh, you're just going to bang hot, hot whores until you get to be seven years old and then you're going to die and you'll be a lonely old man. That's not what this is about. Like people want to, oh, what's the end game, Rolo? Tell me what the end game is because I think I'm already at the end game and I think I'm there and I'm better than you because I'm at the end game and I see the force for the trees. I, that, no, you're not there because you didn't have that same experience and you probably made bad decisions accordingly. So all I'm saying is game, PUA, whatever you want to call it, playing the game, being in there, dating women, dealing with women, understanding women, having experience with women is part of you having a successful relationship down the, hopefully having a good relationship down the way because you're informed, because you have better judgment of character and because you're in a better position for selection. There you go. I mean, it's it's like in 2020, man. Like men, especially if you have like some some like things to lose, or you got a man of means, you got some resources, whatever it may be. Like you need to treat like marriage like it, it's got a like <laughs> it's a serious commitment. And honestly, in this, today's climate, I don't suggest it unless you want to raise a family because obviously uh, having children uh, works better in a two parent household. But like for the most part, man, most of the time, I do not see marriage as like a viable option for most men in today's current climate. You know, I mean, obviously Rolo was able to make it work, but mm -hmm. he got married in a different time and age. You know, nowadays women are 100% incentivized to, to divorce you and take your money. I mean, I've seen mm -hmm. it before where women will talk to a divorce, a divorce attorney before they even walk down the aisle with you. You know what I'm saying? So you guys just got to be prepared and aware. Oh, it's a, it's a machine. Um, from the time you, from the time you buy the ring to get on your knees and propose to her on the jumbotron to the time that you're sitting across from her at the divorce settlement, there are people making money all along the way Thanks. and you know, the wedding, the counseling, the kids, the whatever, everything along the way there is, there is a, it's a machine. There's an industry banking on the fact that you're going to fail. So yeah. I'm that guys, like there's literally an industry. Yeah, it's so predictable. They make a lot of money off of it, but I, I, and I, and I feel you like uh, people, particularly trad cons like to throw rocks at me because they say, well, that Rolo, he's just telling all those guys to, to go out there and just bang random whores, right? You know, it's all spin plates, hypergamy, hypergamy, hypergamy. What about saving? What about families? And okay, I'm, I have probably a better family life than most of the guys who are criticizing me. I've been married for 24 years. I've got a, a, a daughter who's doing her postgraduate work right now. She's a pageant winner, gorgeous. You know, I'm, I, I, I have said this before. I attribute the success of my marriage to being red pill aware <laughs> to yeah. actually having run game. I didn't call it that, but back in the day, you know, and understanding women's nature and doing what I do. Right. And so like, so I get it from that side. And then the other side of course is going to be the MGTOW side. Well, how can't believe you'd promote marriage. It's horrible. You're going to die. Everything, you know, it's you're doomed. You're going to put the news or you wrote, what is it? Uh, you're wa marching men to the slaughterhouse. Uh, yeah. Like, no, I don't. I, I, I've said this a billion times is I do not advocate for marriage the way we do it now. It used to be a great idea. It was the bedrock of Western civilization. Monog socially enforced monogamy and marriage was the bedrock of Western civilization right. for a long time. Not so much anymore because we have ruined it. And so the people will say, well, how come you can't endorse marriage? That's why I don't endorse marriage. But you have a great marriage. I know I do. But I'd have it in spite of that, which is why I'm, I, I have to be logical about that. I got to be pragmatic about the whole thing. So, uh, Is marriage uh, necessary for raising a family? Um, it used to be. I would hope it would be still now. I wish it was. I wish it could be. Put it that way. I wish marriage, like was it 42% of babies in the United States are born out of wedlock right now. 
So this is an epidemic of single mothers as as a result of you know gynocentrism ever since like 1965, right? Since the since the sexual revolution. So I wish it could be because what we what's happened right now, Stone Spirit Beast, whatever your name is, um, is we have shifted away from a marriage based way, a marriage based model of raising children to a child support based model of raising children. And I wish it wasn't that way. I wish it was necessary. But it's it's not. Unfortunately, it's not because now it's all about the village, right? It's like it takes a village to raise children. <laughs> right. So, anyways, um, we I should we should bug out of here. Um, tomorrow, or excuse me, uh, I will be doing a Patreon uh, members only uh, uh, Q and A tomorrow in the afternoon. Watch for that if you're a pa- if you're a Patreon subscriber. If you're not, why not? Um, just hit the link down there. It's all of my links are in the uh, the description there. Uh, if you want to support the show, you can, of course. Also much appreciated. Thank you for all of the super chats today, and thank you, Myron, for joining me. This has been a a good show. I like the reason I, I let me the jig is up. Let me explain why I wanted Myron on here is because I think that Myron and, and John as well um, it represents a side like the the practical side of all of this. I've said before that the red pill is a theory and game is the practice. And the game, uh, PUA, if you want to call it PUA, fine, whatever. But the game is is the practice. It's the field work that informs Red Pill. And the Red Pill will be incomplete without game. And game will be incomplete without the Red Pill. So it's theory and practice. Here's the theory. Let's go test it. Game goes out and tests it and experiments with it and comes back and says, well, this is this worked and then this didn't. So then we modify the theory and we go back and we make a new one as a result of that. That's really kind of like this scientific method, right? <laughs> um, game has changed, and it's no longer mystery method. It's no longer uh, fuzzy hats and black nail polish and and elevator boots anymore. That's it's not that anymore. Uh, it's a convenient like caricature for most people because they don't know. Everybody hates the pay- pickup artist. That's the boogeyman. You don't want to be like those guys. You don't want to be like that. Oh, here's my black n- nail polish, right? You don't want to be that guy. Here's here, but come over to my coaching and I'll teach you how not to be that guy. I'm telling you that game is the practice. Red pill is the theory. If you right about a lot of things like his, like his book, I still think any guy that wants to become good with women, you need to internalize the fundamentals of the, the attraction triggers that he talks about, you know, leader of man, uh, high social proof, all these things where he talks about in the book. However, his uh, methodologies now are dated. We live in a social media age where phones are the current currency and you kind of have to pattern break. You know, cold approaching a woman with indirect openers in 2020 isn't going to have the same potency it did 20 years ago. But right. his theory is excellent. It's just that his application is dated nowadays. Right. And that's what I'm trying to do with you. And that's what I'm trying to do with, with John is and Troy, too, um, is sort of bring game up to the you know 2020s right now. Because yeah. no longer is it so much about the clubs, even it's about in- Instagram is, is how we vet right now. It's no longer about a number close. It's about, you know, okay, what's your Insta? You know, it's it, like a number close just means nothing today. No. Yeah, it's nothing, Absolutely nothing today, but we still think that it's a big deal. Most guys, like I said, there's, you know, what's 52% of guys are living with their, their, your folks right now and they're not in the clubs because they're like why would i go out and do that why would i bother why would i need to do you know if if you're if you're so if you're in a point where you're between 18 and 29 years old and you don't have your own home or you don't have a or maybe you have roommates or whatever um what's your incentive right what's your incentive to to go out and and bother with anything i think one of the reasons why migtow and I, i say migtow but like the black pill um you know, incels, doom pill, whatever you want to call it is so popular right now. It's a, it's an economic factor as well. Why not? It's the easier thing to do. I'm not going to go out there and take a chance with that. They'll just blow me out because why? Because I still have at home with my mom, you know, I'm 28 years old and I still do that. So it seems like a better idea. So we find, we look for ways to sort of justify why we're not going out there and taking chances and taking risks and learning and doing things because they're not in a position to do it. Yeah. Yeah, as a man, you got to get out there and, and take your L's and not be scared, guys. Just get out there and approach chicks. It's going to pay dividends later, man. Right. Um, uh, I'll just say this real quick. I just made a Patreon, my friend, Fresh Print CEO, we, we, uh, where we're basically giving you guys behind the scenes stuff of how we deal with girls in Miami. We tell you guys our wins, our W's, our double dates that we go on where we learn a lot of information at uh, patreon.com slash fresh fit. And then you guys can follow me on Instagram on Unplug Fit. 
Right. And yeah, man, I'm, I'm really, uh, Rolo, thank you for having me on, man. I'm not going to get to these today, guys. Uh, if you guys have questions for Myron, you can email him. Um, you can yeah, unplug fit at email right. com, guys. Or and my YouTube channel is unplug, uh, unplug fitness. Uh, I, I think I linked it. It's youtube.com backslash C slash unplug fit. Um, and yeah, guys hit me up there. I can definitely answer those quite minor elaborate on kids one day and dating four and oh man that's a good question yeah, yeah go and save that for later hey we are going to be on uh rule zero on saturday on rich cooper's channel you'll be on there as well we're going to be announcing the digital conference that we had to move from las vegas to an online format because of travel restrictions on thanks to covid so uh you know the guys in canada can't get back into their country troy can't get back into the uk and of course john is living in japan and he does not want to not be able to re-enter the country so we're kind of screwed so the only way we could really pull this off is to do a, a digital conference but we'll we'll give you all the details of that on uh, saturday it'll be 11 30 a.m eastern that'll be on rich cooper's channel which is entrepreneurs in cars did you want to drop a plug for yourself uh yeah just you guys want to find me unplug fit on instagram uh patreon.com slash fresh fit we just made that we're gonna mm -hmm. have a podcast tomorrow on my channel on unplug fitness 6 p.m eastern standard time me and my boy fresh prince we're gonna go over 10 ways to tell she belongs to the streets, which is going to be good for some of you guys that are trying to get an LTRs and everything like that. So definitely check it out. And uh, the two guys that gave the super test to Rolo, go ahead and DM me uh, directly at those questions and I'll answer them for you because uh, I want to make sure you guys get the value for donating to the channel for, for Rolo. So I'll do that for you guys. Great. Thanks a lot, Myron. It's been a good. Have me on, Rolo. It's great. On Saturday. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.